All right, everybody, welcome to our Ratio Christie Summer Apologetic Series that we've been doing. We actually started this um, a year or two ago, I think, where we take the month of July and just go over some different apologetic topics. Um, most of the people will probably see this on YouTube. So if you go to our our YouTube channel, for those maybe watching now who haven't uh, seen it yet, uh, go to Ratio Christie, R-A-T-I-O-C-H-R-I-S-T-I -I -I at Winthrop University. And we actually started last week with our first uh, guest. We had Professor Ken Samples from Reasons to Believe. He's uh, a philosopher. He's uh, an apologist. Uh, Reasons to Believe is probably the biggest one of the biggest science uh, think tanks in apologetics. Um, and we did his book, um, Christianity Cross-Examine. Uh, tonight, we are going to be hosting a discussion between my good friend, Pastor Nathan Taylor, and my wife will read that bio in a minute, and then my other friend, Dennis Knapp. Dennis was actually gracious enough to uh, have me on his podcast with Matt Graham to do a talk on abortion or discuss some things on abortion, so it was a lot of fun. Next week, we have Dr. Brian Huffling from Southern Evangelical Seminary is going to be on. We're going to talk about why evangelicals should embrace uh, many of the thoughts of St. Thomas Aquinas. It's kind of a hot button issue now that uh, comes up in a lot of discussions. So it'd be good to have him on. And of course, people can come and ask questions. So uh, with that said, uh, the format tonight, uh, we're going to have two 15 opening minute uh, statements, uh, just kind of defining what the positions are. And then from there, we will go into a series of questions that uh, both Nate and Dennis have already prepared for each other beforehand. They've already had some time to look at them. And uh, basically, the way it's going to go is each person will get three questions and we'll go about 20 minutes each question. And so that'll be about two hours. Uh, and so uh, afterward, we'll open it up for Q&A uh, for about 30 minutes or so. We don't want to take too much time just because I um, realize both both guys may, uh, you know, already go in a little bit long. So uh, that said, Melissa, I will go ahead and uh, kick it to you for the biographies. Well, yeah, we have um, two awesome guests today. Um, so Pastor Nate Taylor, uh, who is a friend of ours, um, grew up in Southern California, and although he was raised in a Christian home, he became skeptical of Christianity by the time he started high school, and he finally accepted Christ at the age of 20 after hearing the evidence and reasons for Christianity. He felt the call to ministry, so um, he began studying the Bible and evangelizing, and as time went on, he felt called to go to school to learn more about the Bible. Um, he first went to Biola University. For a bachelor's degree in Bible and theology, and after Biola, Nate went on to receive two master's degrees from Westminster Seminary, California, and Talbot School of Theology. And he's previously served as youth pastor at the Bridge Church in South Carolina, where he taught the youth how to defend their faith and evangelize to others. He joined Corner Canyon as a teaching pastor. Um, that's in Utah, um, as a teaching pastor in April 2016. And because of his background, Nate is very passionate about evangelism, apologetics, and preparing youth spiritually for college. Um, and he has a lovely wife, Laura, and two little ones. So thank you for taking time out of your schedule, busy pastoral and family schedule to be with us, Nate. Thank you. Well, it's good to be here. Yeah, absolutely. And Dennis Snap, he is um, a Latin Rite Catholic who lives outside of Dallas, Texas. Um, with his wife Rebecca and their three children um, um, and he holds degrees in history at the BA and MA levels and MA in education, um, a convert to, Cap to the Catholic Church um, in 2001 from the Reformed Calvinist tradition, Dennis loves patristics, church history, apologetics, and anything written by J.R.R. Tolkien. Uh, I love Tolkien also. Dennis has studied um, under patristic scholar, Dr. David Hunter and medieval historian, Dr. Kelly, is it DeVries, DeVries? Okay, DeVries, okay. Um, and incidentally, Dr. Hunter also served as, um, Dennis is sponsored as confirmation to the church. Dennis also has a blog, The Latin Rite, where he writes about theological, political and cultural issues from a conservative Catholic perspective. And he occasionally co-hosts What Comes Next with 
Matt Graham on YouTube. And Matt's um, a good friend of ours through Asher Christie, who actually is the uh, kind of the, the glue that um, hooked all of us together. So Dennis, thank you for being here. I know with your busy schedule as well and your family, I appreciate you. All right. So uh, with that said, uh, who would like to go first? Is, am, I, am I leaving anything out, Melissa? Where can people uh -huh. find us, I guess? That might be important. What, huh? Where can people find us? And uh, click Oh, where can people can find us? Oh, we're kind of all over the place. Um, Facebook, Rasha Christie Winthrop. Instagram, Rasha Christie Winthrop. YouTube, Rasha Christie Winthrop. Just look up Rasha Christie Winthrop and you kind of find Devin and Melissa. We uh, kind of are a little all over the place in terms of ministry and that, so. <laughs> Full-time apolog full apologist with Rasha Christie. And uh, it's kind of, this is, this is what we do for a living. And so. Yeah, we're supportive missionaries. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to emphasize that. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, we're still, well, we're still trying to raise support. <laughs> yes. So we're not fully supported. So feel free to hook us up. So, uh, all right, let's get on with it. Um, so I haven't really talked uh, with, with uh, Dennis and Nate. Is that, is that okay if I just call you guys Dennis and Nate? Okay. No emperor or anything this time, Nate. How about the hammer? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's for you, Matt. Uh, who wants to go first? Uh, so we got two 15 minute openings. Who would want to go? Who wants to go first? Well, those who are first are last, right? So. <laughs> what do you think, Dennis? You're, you're, you're the, I'll tell you what, Dennis, you're the guest. You're muted, by the way. Unmute yourself, but uh, you're okay. the guest. Nate's been on. You you tell us. You want him to go first, or you to go first? Um, I'll go first. What the heck? You know, like uh, it's a, uh, it's you know, what do you call it? The uh, the bold. Uh, the, you know, you have to lead boldly or go boldly. Uh, yeah. Where no one has gone before, as Star Trek would say. There you go. No, no man All has right. gone before when I was a kid. But anyway, <laughs> that's another question. So I'm. I have a prepared. I'm going to read off my. Yeah, I read off my. You can just count me on right now. Yeah. Go. Okay. So, my opening statement deals basically with the issue with which is what we're talking about here, which is the issue of authority. Um, what is the true authority in the believer's life? Is it the Bible or is it the church? Because as a Catholic, um, whether or not I agree with the Catholic Church or not, the Catholic Church believes itself to teach the truth, and. First off, let me just say there are people out there who do claim to be Catholic, like our president, who is a Catholic, a Catholic, Catholic, a cafeteria Catholic, or someone who who claims the Catholic faith, but doesn't follow her teachings. So just because you're claimed to be Catholic, uh, doesn't mean you are a faithful Catholic. So there's a difference between people who are faithful to the church's teachings and those who are not. And that also is does it do if people are not faithful, then they are uh, not in full uh, communion with, with their own church. So first I'd like to quote St. Vincent of Loren. He summarizes my position and the church church's position on authority pretty well. He wrote in the mid fifth century after the majority of the heresies were dealt with in the church. He says, here perhaps someone may ask, since the canon of scripture is complete, and more sufficient and more than sufficient in itself, why is it necessary to add to it the authority of ecclesial interpretation? As a matter of fact, we must answer the Holy Scripture, because of its depth, is not universally accepted in one and the same sense. The same text is interpreted differently by different people, so that one may almost gain the impression that it can yield as many different meanings as there are men. Novitian, for example, expounded passages one way, Sibyllus the other, Donat, Donatus, or Arius, uh, he goes on to list some other ones, and then Pelagius. Finally, still another Nestorius. Thus, because the great distortions caused by various errors, it is indeed necessary that the trend of the interpretation of the prophetic and apostolic writing be directed in accordance with the rule of the ecclesial and Catholic meaning. So that was from his uh, commentary. 
and that was about the mid uh, fifth century. So as the intellectual heirs of the Protestant reformers, the postmodernists, redefine words to reshape their world today, like gender and racism, their Protestant reformer forebears redefine words like faith and church to justify reshaping and reimagining the historical church, or as the historical church defined itself as one holy and apostolic, the new definition of, of theirs was where the gospel was preached and the sacraments were not neglected. Where, so, sorry, where the sacraments are not neglected. That's, where, that's from Calvin. By redefining the word church, the reformers made their individual and personal interpretations of scripture the new and true authority in the church. For who is it that is that should constitute what is the true meaning of the word and sacraments? Therefore, this redefinition is nothing more or less than the justification and continuation of the reformer's schism of the apostolic church. And my arguments go uh, like this. Soil Scriptura lacks the scriptural and historical merits that scripture alone, revelation is only in written form, is a final authoritative norm, uh, norm of doctrine and practices. The church, since the Council of Jerusalem, has viewed itself truly as authoritative in matters of doctrine and practice. These council, councils were conducted to settle disputes over dis different scriptural interpretations. The church exercised authority in dealing with these theological and moral crises when they settled demanded that we obey that settlement at the risk of excommunication. Excommunication and anathema entail the belief in real authority, not a civil dialogue like we're having today with no universal binding consequences. This shows that the scripture alone was not enough to settle theological disputes. Only those given real true apostolic authority through succession can interpret the Bible. Apostolic succession has been the regula fide method of safeguarding its, its improper interpretations and novelties since the founding of the church. God gave us a church, not merely a book to read. The formation of the Bible was a historical contingency, which was born out of opportunity. Do I have, how much more time do I have? Are we still good? Yes, you, can, you still have like 10 minutes. Okay. And I'd like to go over various various verses that support sola scriptura for example first corinthians 4 6 says do not go beyond the written word i it's quite an ex accidental stretch to infer that saint paul was saying here that the verse that the bible at what was written is the only infallible rule of doctrine or practice even reformers like john calvin did not see this verse as proof of sola scriptura and did not in, interpret what was written to mean that exactly, what is Scola Scriptura. He actually said it was actually a very small matter and left it up, up to his readers to decide whether what Paul was saying or what Paul was referring to was what he had written in that letter or his writings in general. Um, Luther is actually silent on it. And also that verse when taken to, as, as, a, as a justification for Sola Scriptura, goes against 2 Thessalonians 2.15, which states, hold fast and firm to the traditions which were taught to you by either oral statement or letter of ours. Another is Matthew 15, one through nine. This is the passage that talks about the traditions of men. First, these verses show that Jesus is disagreeing with the Pharisees over their interpretation of uh, Jewish tradition. He is talking about in that context that they are saying, you know, why are your disciples not washing their hands, which is according to the law? And then Jesus responds back to him and say, well, why do you say those things which are, which are held back for God, you can't give to your parents when the Bible, when the law clearly states you should honor your father and mother. And that overrules a, a, a very basic rule of washing your hands. Um, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, this is the, this is the go-to verse that most Protestants refer to uh, when they talk about Sola Scriptura. Hold on, my mouth is dry. This verse is uh, not a support of Sola Scriptura because 
the Bible, the verses that what Paul is saying here is that scripture is, is God breathed. It's not saying it's sufficient. And also at, during the time that this was written, Paul, some more, majority of the, the New Testament wasn't written. So um, you basically have a, a referent that is, is saying one thing, but Protestants are expanding that to include more than what Paul is saying. And again, it's not saying that the Bible is sufficient in all things. The verse the next is Acts 17, 11, which is the Bereans. This verse says that the Bereans had noble character for, for examining the scriptures, which would be the Old Testament, to see if Paul was, what, what Paul said was true. This verse nowhere says that scriptures are the only authority, but that the Bereans were, were more noble than the Thessalonians who ran Paul out of town. So, and also to examine the scripture does not mean, does not equate to only scripture. Second Peter 3.15. This verse talks about Paul's letters being authoritative. Yes, they are. Catholics and Protestants agree. But it warns also of those who will distort the interpretation of scripture that will lead to their own destruction. And then, therefore, I, I view this verse as, some, as a verse that says that is against Sola Scriptura and is in line with what St. Vincent was talking about when he talks about how there's others like Arius and uh, uh, Pelagius who interpret scripture improperly. Now the church exercises real authority. Since the time of the apostles, the church exercised real authority in doctors and practice. This was first seen in the book of Acts, where it's recorded that the leaders of the church made circumcisions, no, circumcision no longer a requirement for Gentiles to enter the church. This is at the Council of Jerusalem. The Old Testament was very clear regarding the requirements of circumcision, but the church declared itself authoritative in deciding that it was not. Where in the Old Testament did the apostles get this new doctrine on circumcision? They couldn't have gotten it from the, from the Old Testament. They couldn't have gotten it from their scripture. The Council of Jerusalem, the Council of Nicaea, Ephesus, Constantinople, Chalcedon, were all authoritative and universally binding concerning issues of doctrine or practice. To dissent me meant excommunication and anathema. Excommunication and anathema requires real authority. Again, the regular fide had at its foundation apostolic succession. Apostolic succession had been the re regular fide method of safeguarding against improper novelty and innovation since the founding of the church. Again, I refer back to St. Vincent. And also, there's no inspired table of contents. There's nothing that tells us in the Bible what's in the Bible. Regarding nation, nature of the New Testament canon, these books were produced in the first 200 years of Christianity, some say earlier, some say later, and they were, and they were dispute over which books should be accepted. The, ex the universally accepted ones from the beginning were the Gospels, Acts, the writings of Paul, Others were reject, others were uh, reluctantly accepted, like Jude and Second Peter and, and three John and Hebrews and the book of Revelation. Other early books were rejected, like the Didache and the Shepherd of Hermas, the Gospel of the Hebrews, the Acts of Paul. This is all according to Eusebius in his uh, in chapter five of his history. The apostolic, the apostles left their writings, but they did not leave the church a table of content. The church authorities in charge had the task of determining what would be and what would be not included in the canon. Again, and the way Sola Scriptura sort of fails to meet its own criteria of doctrinal truth, no list of inspired books are shown explicitly or explicitly in scripture. Therefore, we have no biblical justification for the contents of the Bible. The Protestants rely on the church to tell them which books are in there. They go outside the Bible, which is extra biblical, to tell them what the Bible is. Another issue is translation. Now, Geisler and, the, and, and those in his camp talked about the Bible being perfectly clear. It was, uh, I have a bit of a tongue problem because I had my wisdom tooth removed. <laughs> so it's, uh, I think that he calls a propiscuous or perpiscuity, um, saying it's perfectly clear. But when we look at basic translations of certain Bible verses, for example, 1 Peter 3.21, the NIV says, as the water symbolizes baptism that now saves you, not the removal of dirt from the body, 
but a pledge of a clear conscience towards God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus. The Revised Standard Version says, baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but impel to God for a clear conscience to the resurrection of Jesus. So as a, as a Protestant, when I was first a, a Christian, I read the NIV, that Bible verse obviously leans towards the Baptist Bible, you know, only, uh, you know, symbolic view of baptism, where the other one is more of a question. Okay, and then what about the common man? Up until the 19th century, the majority of people were illiterate, so they couldn't even read the Bible. So whether or not the Bible was the ultimate authority in a believer's life up until the mid-19th century, and I believe that Protestants would say that all men in, in Timothy was referring to all men, not just educated men, whether or not the Bible is authoritative or not was mute or was moot to them because they couldn't read it anyway. And then how many Bibles were there? That's another issue I see is the fact that Bibles were handwritten and therefore they were expensive and hard to produce. So the Bibles that people couldn't read were not very, were in short supply. Skull straw, sorry. One second. Hey, Dennis, you got about yeah. one. You got about one. I'm wrapping it up right here. This is no my problem. last paragraph. Soul scripture, yeah. Ultimately, it's concerned with the justification of one's personal interpretation of scripture. It allows the individuals in, in, or individuals in agreement to chart their own, own theological course. As a species, the Bible is a written work. It requires a reader that has a mind with intelligence and a will to act. The reader then assimilates, contemplates, and exegetes the passage of the Bible to come to the conclusion theologically. The Bible itself does not have a will or a mind. It cannot be a judge or settle agreements. As stated before, the only clear biblical reference to Scholes Torah is Peter 3.16, which, which Peter warns that ignorant and, stable, ignorant and unstable people distort the word of God. Sola Scriptura proves that the individual believer is the authority and has justification for their own th theological beliefs. It is seen as multitude and magnitude of denominations in the world it enthroned one's own personal interpretation of the Bible and dethrones the proper authority, the church. All right. Thank there. you, Mr. <laughs> uh, Dennis. That was good. And, sorry, uh, if I, sorry, I had to read that. I, I was just trying to get, and I'm, you know, I, there's some nerves, you know, so I apologize if I stuttered or, or uh, it was hard no, to listen did, to, but I was trying to you get did, it. You did, you did great. Real quick, uh, Melissa, uh, give us the title of this discussion again. I forgot we had a, and, and just for people watching too, this is not like a formal debate. This is just a discussion between two, two of my good friends. Uh, but, uh, and I'm sorry, I'm on my phone because I'm having computer issues. So I don't have all the, I'm not able to bring everything up on my computer, but um, I see Melissa frantically looking there. Do you have the title for the discussion or maybe Nate or Dennis might remember it? Dennis, do you remember the title for this? Uh, what what is? I think I mentioned them in my opening statement. It's what has the what has the final authority, the the scripture or the church or the Bible? Okay. Yeah. Wonderful. Oh yeah, the, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, the is scripture or is scripture or the church the final authority? Yeah. So, there you go. Oh, that's right. Yeah. All right, Nate. Um, gonna are you good to go for your 15 minutes? I am. So just one thing. Uh, I'm in the corner over there because I'm at a friend's house, a uh, congregant's house, to record this. And I left my laptop uh, thing at home, and I have a bad one here. So it, in, in the case of this computer shutting off, I have a backup there in the corner. You see my name? So we'll, we'll just go to that in case this thing shuts down and all this uh, Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I see it. Uh -huh. just, just FYI. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. So Melissa, do you want to set a timer? Uh, sure. Okay. Tell me when you're ready, Melissa. Okay, we're ready. Okay, well, let me first uh, start by saying thanks for hosting this event, Devin and Melissa, and uh, thanks for having this uh, dialogue with me, Dennis. Uh, I think the issues we're discussing today are important. Uh, we, it's how we know uh, the God of the universe, how he's revealed himself, and you know who is the final authority here. And so I'm defending the position of scripture alone, and let me give just a definition of what that is. So scripture alone is with respect to special revelation, scripture and scripture alone is the only infallible rule 
faith and practice. So there's just two things I want to point out about this. One, this doesn't exclude um, general revelation that we know God and his attributes through nature, creation, and conscience. So we know uh, truths about God apart from scripture um, and nature, according to Romans 1. So that does not violate sola scriptura. This is with regard to special revelation. And then secondly, I don't deny church authority or tradition at, at, at all. I just don't say it's the final uh, final say or the final infallible authority. I think like parents and uh, the government that I, you, we are to obey uh, church leaders, we're to obey church tradition. Um, I hold to six ecumenical councils of the six great ecumenical councils, as many evangelical Christians do. Um, and so I recognize their authority. They have authority in my life. Um, and uh, they're just ultimately subjected to the ultimate infallible rule, which is scripture itself. Um, so I would say like, I would tell children to listen to their parents. So I would tell uh, congregants and people to listen to church leaders and to church tradition. It's just not infallible. Um, so I just wanna offer three reasons briefly as to why I think this. Um, the, the first one comes from 1 Corinthians 4, 6, and that was cited in Dennis's opening statement. And so it says, I have applied all these things to myself and Apollos, your benefit brothers, that you may learn by us not to go beyond what is written, that none of uh, you may be puffed up in favor of one against the other. So uh, the Greek word here is the Greek word gagraphitai. And, uh, and what a lot of scholars have observed, uh, contrary to Calvin, who, uh, you know, is that what, what New Testament scholarship has come to, is that this Greek word is used over uh, 30 times in... Uh, in uh, Paul's writings, every single time it means scripture. And so the way to translate then 1 Corinthians 4, 6, and this is what the majority of scholars grant graphitai meaning here, is that you may learn by us not to go beyond scripture. So we're not to go beyond scripture for faith and practice, and so it follows that scripture alone is taught from this text. Now, a second one that was mentioned too is Acts 17, 11, and it says, now these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness. Um, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. So the no, the nobility here is modifying the entire statement. Namely, they were examining the apostle Paul, ultimately. They were examining him. So scripture was subject, uh, or uh, apostle was subject to scripture here. So scripture was, was being used to judge an apostle. And if that was true in the first century, when the apostolic office and prophecy was going on, and Paul says in Thessalonians, he speaks the very word of God. If if that's kind of the uh, the, uh, the the pecking order in the first century, where they're subjecting Paul to Scripture, then how much more is it true today when people you know say they they were passed down by the apostles? And so Scripture has authority ultimately over apostles or those who claim to be apostles today. If it did for Paul. Now, uh, so those are the biblical reasons for for thinking that. I want to give a second type of reasoning. This is the inherent reasonableness and commonsensical nature of uh, a scripture alone from a historical standpoint. The Bible itself teaches us that we're to use reason. It says many times in Paul's writings, you know, judge for yourselves. Um, you know, Jesus commands us to, to reason and judge for ourselves. In Acts 17, Paul reasons with the philosophers. These 1 Peter 3.15, the Bible tells us to use reason, defend the Christian faith. And so the Bible authorizes, by good and necessary inference, the, the use of reason and critical thinking. And the point I want to make is that Scripture alone accords with what's most reasonable in terms of how we do historical investigation. Let me explain. When you look at the question as to what did Jesus and the apostles taught on a certain subject, how do we go about answering such a question? And uh, what historical sources in this endeavor should take priority? Well, it would seem to me that any reasonable and responsible historian would say, well, all things being equal, we got to go to the earliest sources, right? That's how you figure out how someone thinks. And you know, if you want to know how uh, Plato thinks, you go to the earliest sources of Plato to figure that out. And the earliest Christian sources we have of what the apostles and Jesus taught is, surprise, surprise, the New Testament. And so as one studies the New Testament, it is obvious to me that it is as higher priority over, over other or, you know, later Christian sources, whether it's a third or fourth century, the New Testament has a uh, priority in terms of what we think Jesus and the apostles thought. Isn't that just common sense in terms of how we do historical investigation? 
And so it doesn't make much sense to put second, third, and fourth, fifth century sources on the same level as our best and earliest historical sources to the Christian movement. Now, I don't believe any responsible historian would, would do this, especially in light of the fact that the New Testament is recognized uh, as the best attested books in the ancient world. And it's it's taken to be the earliest and the best information we have on the earliest Christian movement. So, I mean, it's very commonsensical to take the New Testament that way. And I think every person sees this as intuitive. But for instance, if we found out, and let's just kind of play this out as a thought experiment, if we found out that a church father clearly contradicted the Bible on a subject, our natural inclination, inclination is going to go with following the Bible over that second or third century father. Um, and there's actually an example of this. So the one I want to give, and we all do this, I mean, everybody intuitively does this when we're looking and trying to investigate what Jesus' life was like, what he taught. So um, the church father Arrhenius taught that Jesus was over 50 years old. I'm going to quote from his writings now. Um, Arrhenius against heresies, book two, uh, chapter 22 and verse five. Now the stage, uh, now, that, now that the first stage of early life embraces 30 years and that this extends onward to the 40th year, everyone will admit uh, but from the 40th and the 50th year, a man begins to decline towards old age, which our Lord possessed. Well, he still fulfilled the office of a teacher. So Jesus was 50, he's saying. Even as the gospel and the elders testify, those who were conversant in Asia and John, disciples of the Lord, affirming that John conveyed to them that information that Jesus was 50 years old and he remained among them up to the time of Trojan. Some of them, moreover, saw not only John, but the other apostles also and heard the very same account from them, saying, I got this from the earliest sources and bear testimony as to the validity of the statement. Whom then shall, should we rather believe? So he is, he's using uh, the apostolic tradition authority saying, hey, Jesus was 50, year, 50 years old here. I want to say no Catholic or Protestant, no scholar thinks that Jesus was 50 years old. No one thinks this was actually legitimately passed down by the apostles. And so when a church father contradicts scripture, we automatically, just intuitively, as investigating what Jesus and the apostles thought historically, we automatically give a primacy and priority to scripture as uh, more reliable than some later church father. And so because of this, scripture alone, I would say, has this intuitive a historical appeal. So the burden of proof is on the detractors to say, okay, like, um, I don't think this is a legit, legitimate method and show why that is because this has that intuitive historical appeal in terms of doing history. The third and final reason, Devin, how am I doing on time? Where are we at the time? Doing good, man. You got about, uh, what, 10 minutes, 10 minutes or so. Oh man, I'm right. Okay. Thank you. Um, the third and final reason uh, I would like to offer supporting scripture alone is that, uh, ironically, church tradition gives more evidence for scripture alone than not. So the, the favor is on scripture alone here, especially if you just hold the base, basic church authority as all traditional Protestants do. Um, and you have plenty of church fathers holding the authority of the church. I can agree with those, but we have plenty saying scripture alone. In fact, I'm not aware of a single statement from any church father, and I would challenge someone to bring up one of these, and from any church far, father saying that scripture and tradition are on the same level, it was passed down, and scripture are on the same authoritative le level, or church authority and scripture are on the same le level. Rather, it seems when you look at the church fathers, they give greater primacy to church, uh, to scripture over tradition and um, church authority. So let me just quote Augustine here. Um, on, in his uh, book on the sameness of the substance in the Trinity here, he says, I am not bound by the authority of Erminium, and you are not bound by that of Nicene, uh, but by the authority of Nicaea, excuse me, <laughs> I mumbled those, by the authority of scriptures that are not the property of anyone, but the common witness for both of us. Let us both do battle with position, case with case, reason with reason. Um, so the authority of scripture is, is that's what we're going to use to figure this out, he's saying. And then Augustine um, and William Goods, volume two, pages uh, 341 through 342 says, they must show by the canonical books of the divine scripture alone, alone. And then Athanasius of Alexandria, this uh, St. Athanasius, um, 
and it's vestal water here. He says, these are a fa are fountains of salvation that they who thirst may be satisfied with the living words they contain. In these alone is proclaimed the doctrine of godliness. Let no man add to these, neither let uh, him take uh, uh, aught from these. For, for concerning these, the Lord put to shame the Sadducees and said, ye do err, not knowing the scriptures. And he reproved the Jews, saying, search the scriptures, for these are they that testify of me. So there we have Athanasius Festival letter, and we have, um, um, we have, I have a few others, but I'm going to cut to the chase here. This is the summarization from uh, Jane D. Kelly. He writes this. He says, further, it was, and they said, respected church historian. He says, for they was, it was uh, everywhere taken for granted that for any doctrine to win acceptance, it had first uh, to establish its scriptural basis. So that scripture was copiously used to establish uh, these, the, these truths of doctrine here and kind of summarizing them. So scripture has a primacy, it seems, when you read, read these fathers. I have more quotes, um, but they, it has a primacy here. Um, and there's nothing that, uh, that I've, I've read, I've looked into this, which says that scripture, tradition, or the church are on, on equal balance, or that perhaps scripture or tradition, if you want to argue, is greater, uh, that tradition is greater than scripture. So we don't have anything like this. And so I think we're justified in, in believing, given what church fathers have said, given um, what, what scripture has said, and given just how we do history. I think when you look at all of these three planks, I think we're reasonable and, and well-established um, here in thinking that scripture alone is true. And so uh, Denison has to tear down all three of these pillars I have, the reason, knowing the, the reasonableness of, of kind of scripture and then knowing the biblical basis. And then we have, of course, the church father basis. So I look forward to uh, having a good discussion with him. All right, uh, you got a few minutes left. You just gonna forego those? Um, I, I can read a few more quotes, but you know, I mean, we can just bring it's, it up. It's your in, call. In the, in yeah. The discussion. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. That's fine. All right. So, uh, at this point in the discussion, now we will go ahead and move into the time of prepared questions. And so, how this will work is, uh, I guess we'll kind of let Dennis Dennis go next. It seems to be kind of the order of it. So, um, basically, we're going to take about twenty minutes. Uh, Dennis, take. Uh, ask your question and you can kind of control the, the conversation and uh let's have some let's have some good dialogue so um yep your time starts now okay well now I, I thought that uh you were going to read the question to nate so i didn't prepare oh, my uh, questions for him i can look on my phone i, I can look i, I can yeah, yeah. I just I, my, I, like I said, I'm having computer issues, so okay. um, unless you're not the only one, you're not the yeah. only one, man. I tell you what, this has been kind of interesting. <laughs> you know? My my original laptop died before this, like ten minutes before this started. I'm using my wife's laptop. But thank <laughs> thank God, but thank God, I just bought we, we I just bought her like a week and a half ago. So I I could have Melissa look up. The no, time. I found it. I found it. Okay. okay. Um, and then, like I said, I, I look forward to addressing some of the issues because there are some things that Nate brought up in his in his opening statement that I like to address specifically when I have my time. But I'll, I'll ask him my questions right well, now. Well, let me let me let me ask you guys this: Did you guys want to take a few minutes? Because I, I hadn't really thought about it. Did you guys want to take a, um, like five minutes each to do like a little rebuttal, or you just want to do the questions? Next? Well, I, you know, I mean, unless it gets out of hand, I, I just Dennis can just ask me things. Okay. Um, that way, I, well, I think it's more of a has a conversate conversational like tone to it. So if yeah. if, if we want to just have like take Let's that ten that. minutes, you Let's, would. Well, I, yeah. I just want to make one just one comment, just just be about the Jesus being fifty years old quote, is that I have a I have my favorite quote that um, I think I turn I coined. I'm not sure I haven't seen anywhere, but um, the church throughout her history has um, set the borders of orthodoxy when it uh, you know um, how's it go so. It, it is, it is in, in reaction to a heresy that the borders of orthodoxy are defined. So up until a point, there's going to be divergence in the early church. Like even when you talk about the Trinity, the Trinity had a lot of different views that were after Nicaea and after um, Constantinople would be considered heresy. 
because the language and the process of developing an understanding of the Trinity were was, was developing. So there was more free there was more freedom um, in the ex exploration of of this the nature of the Trinity than there was after the definition. And that's my point is that once the church decides on something, it is decided. There's no there's no there's well, let's, no let, let's let's do let's do this. Let's give you each. So you guys are on a kind of a conversation. Dennis, you, you can take 10 minutes and um, you guys can have a conversation. So you have a question maybe about his presentation yeah. and then Nate, you can take 10 minutes to ask some questions and then we'll move into the, the three formal questions. Yeah. So okay. Dennis, what's your question uh, to, to Nate on this and then, uh, or to, to the thing? Uh, again, not so much of a, of a speech, but let's have dialogue on yeah. areas you disagree with. So, like I said, I mean that there there is that there's that space there is that dialogue like we're having now, until the church declares what is and what is not orthodox. Mm -hmm. My question too for Nate about the Bereans, mm -hmm. when Paul went to uh, Berea after he was tossed out of Thessalonica, mm -hmm. and, the, and the Bereans examined everything that Paul wrote according to the to the scripture, which for them would be the Old Testament. That, that they're, you know, Paul, this is Acts. Mm -hmm. This is really early. Mm -hmm before the Council of Jerusalem, would they accept the church's view of or the declaration on circumcision because that would go against what was written in the Old Testament? So the Bereans, if they were using scripture alone, would they reject Paul's teaching? Would they reject the Council of Jerusalem? No, uh, I don't think so. Um, so yeah, that was, you're right. It is it's 17 is after 15 when the Jerusalem Council is at. Um, so what I how I'd process that is say, like, look, okay, they would they would reject his proposal like that, or they wouldn't reject his proposal that you know you don't need to be circumcised to be saved, because uh, Genesis teaches that through Abraham the Gentiles will be blessed, all the nations of the earth will, all the families of the earth will be blessed, which those would be Gentiles, right? So, and then uh, Jeremiah 31, the new covenant, and given that Jesus had come at that point. So I would say that given Old Testament uh, teaching uh, at, that, at that juncture, they would have sufficient evidence in the New Testament to believe what Paul is saying and check it out, that circumcision was going to come to an end. There was going to be a new covenant. And because there's going to be a new covenant, there'd be a new covenant sign. And that would be involved Gentiles coming in. Because through Abraham, and according to the book of Genesis, all the uh, families of the earth are going to be blessed. So they, yeah, they would be able to use the Old Testament to, to, to judge Paul. So they're judging an apostle with the Bible. And I'm saying if that could happen back then, then it seems reasonable by good and necessary inference that could happen today. Yeah, but you see that the, that the Council of Jerusalem is saying that circumcision is no longer necessary, mm -hmm. which... What you the verses you quoted or, or the passages you inferred they don't the, the Old Testament never says that after well, after just, after the institution the, after, just, the, after the yeah. institution of yeah. that it, with Abraham you know if you ask a Jew today if circumcision is necessary they would quote for you <laughs> the verses they would quote for you that you know but they you know they're, 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 it's very clear to them that to be a Jew is to be circumcised so. I don't, you know. Well, so so I gave an argument for that. I didn't just say, oh, well, he would have just read the Old Testament that uh, circumcision was going to come to it. You know, and I, I, I didn't just say that. I actually gave a verse for that. The Gentiles yeah. are going to be blessed. Gentiles are not circumcised. That's what any Jew today would say. Um, so Gentiles are not circumcised. And it says through Abraham, they're going to receive the blessing salvation according to the book of Genesis. And so Paul would simply need to point to that time and say, look, this is that time. Jeremiah 31, the suffering servant, he would need to appeal to that. So in the, in the Old Testament, we have, uh, I think the Trinity is taught. I think the incarnation is taught. I thought all these things are taught. So yeah, it would be really easy to check out. This is that new period where God's going to do something new, the new covenant. And bless. so I actually gave an argument for that. And you just said I didn't. So uh, I, would, I would beg to differ on that. I would say, no, the Gentiles are blessed. That is part of prophetic fulfillment. Paul could easily appeal to that. Um, so, and, and by the way, if you're asked a Jew today, a Jew would deny Jesus being the Messiah. So I think if you take that line of logic too far, you're going to end up in a place you don't want to be. 
Well, I would just say as a rebuttal that right. there's not a, I mean, the Jews can be blessed. I mean, the Gentiles will, you know, be blessed. That does not say, and the Gentiles will not be expected to get circumcised. And the reason why it was an issue, and the reason why the church called the council, like all crisis or churches called councils, is because that was a real issue. Like there was a real issue between Christians that were Gentiles coming into the faith new, and then Jews who were from Jesus's people and were saying, listen, why, why, why do we not have to be circumcised? Why, you know, why don't we have to eat, uh, you know, what, what, you know, meat sacrificed to idols later on, uh, where, where Paul, uh, you know, says that's, or Peter says that's approved. It's like, there, there are apostles making decisions about laws and, and practices in the Old Testament that are, are overruling that. Ancient, the well, ancient so, so the Genesis verse I cited doesn't say that they're going to become Jews and need to follow the Jewish laws, which is what they were saying. That you need to become a Jew in order to have salvation. That was a belief at the time. Okay, so um, what they're what what Genesis actually says is all the families of the earth uh, are going to be blessed. The nations are going to be blessed. Families and nations of the earth are going to be blessed. It doesn't say there that uh that they're going to turn into jews in order to be blessed it just says in virtue of them being this they're going to be blessed and so i i would say that they could use biblical arguments uh and they could check out paul and i think it's an interesting point you raise i'm just not persuaded that we don't have sufficient data in the old testament to, to justify jesus coming and paul being an apostle i think we do have sufficient data in the old testament okay that was my that was my question uh, Dennis, if you if you had uh, you still have a few minutes to go. If you had any other thing you wanted to say on that, on his opening statement, and then we'll give him ten minutes. You have about five minutes to go, so you can go no, it or you I'm, can take it. Okay, I Nate, agree. did you did you want to uh, respond to his uh, opening? Yeah. So um, yeah, it was curious. You mentioned uh, Joseph Biden, our, our president. Um, so. Um, you said that, well, you know, not that not only, never be keeps the, the Catholic teaching, right? Um, and so, but he has, has Joe Biden been officially excommunicated by anybody yet? Um, the church is working on it. Okay, but he's not excommunicated, so he's still a Catholic, technically, right? Well, you know, here, here's another thing that was interesting is that I was listening to Catholic Answers uh, last week, and this guy who was baptized as an infant said, I don't want to be Catholic anymore. And my Protestant, or because uh, he was baptized as a Catholic, uh, infant, he's, he's recognized by the Catholic Church as a Catholic, whether or not he goes through confirmation or first communion, he is part of our family. Now he says, how can I not be a Catholic? How can I remove this, this mark on me that, I was, that was given to me without my permission? And the truth is, regardless of whether Joe, Joe Biden is a good Catholic, a bad Catholic, whether he's a murderer, whether he's an idolater, all that stuff, he's still a Catholic. It's the state of his soul that's the problem, is that he is in a disobedience and he is in mortal sin. So he needs to repent. So he, he, he's a bad Catholic. He's still a Catholic. Well, it, it's interesting, yeah, that you say that, um, you know, because, yeah, I've talked to Catholics that don't agree with that. It's a lot of disagreement on that issue. Um, and so, uh, but I mean, he's, but yeah, you, but he's still a Catholic. You might say he's a bad Catholic, yeah. but any, any individual priest or bishop comments on the state of the souls, that's just their fallible human opinion. So, it, you know, really, it seems like the magisterium would have to do something they did to Luther and kind of cut, cut it off there to make it officially not well, a Catholic well, anymore, communicated. Well, that, that is why they are having this, this controversy right now within the American Catholic Church because bishops like Salvador Colleoni out of San Francisco is saying, listen, this is causing issues. This is causing concern amongst the faithful. This is confusing them. We need to have a declarative uh, statement saying that Joe Biden, as long or any, any Democrat or Republican politician who's a Catholic and accepts abortion cannot receive communion. But like I said, it doesn't mean they're they're not Catholics. Yeah. It's and Luther is a different issue. Luther is someone who 
caused a schism. That's different. If someone causes a schism, then they're under different, um, what do you call it? Different, not diff different punishments than someone who isn't. And also an excommunication, just to be clear, it's not a punishment per se, as much as it is as a trying, as, as the Bible talks about when, when someone is sinning and they eventually you have to expel them so that they come to their senses, so they come back. So it's, re it's removing this, the community from them so they repent. Repentance is the goal of excommunication, not just, you know, being cast out. Yeah, and I was just going back to your original statement that you said that just because someone claims to be a Catholic doesn't mean they're a Catholic. And, and then, well, that's true. I, I can imagine I could, you know, just joke around and say I'm a Catholic and I'm not really Catholic, you know. Well, that's true. I mean, like you're saying, it's hard to get rid of that, especially if someone like, uh, you know, if it's uh, Joe Biden or, I don't know, maybe people have problems with Republicans or Republican Catholic or someone who's some, like Madonna's not excommunicated yet. I don't think she's excommunicated. So, I mean, you know, you have people like, like this who, you know, we, you know, the, they, those people are, are still Catholics in some sense. And I was confused by your language because I thought you were saying the opposite. So it doesn't sound like you're uh, saying uh, that. So it looks no, like I just misunderstood you. That's right. And also let me just tell too, like recently Pope, which is surprising to the left too, because the Pope just came out and said, women cannot be priests. And any bishop or any anybody who ordains a priest and any woman who accepts ordination as a priest from a bishop are all excommunicated. So there is certain things like that's a schism that that is causing disunity. And that's that's what leads to excommunication. Joe Biden, a, a, a civic politician who is not part of the hierarchy of the church, who doesn't believe that, the you know, he is personally pro-life, you know, as, as they say, but doesn't want to push that on someone else. Uh, but all his policies lead towards, you know, more abortion. He he is basically in moral sin and he needs to repent. That's that's where that's where that's at. Well, that's that's an interesting take. So that's all. I, I misunderstood something he said in his opening. So I just wanted to, um, uh, you know, try to understand him a bit more. But I'm I'm done. We can go to his questions now if he's he's done. Okay. Yep. Let's do that, Dennis. So go ahead. We'll take uh, 20 minutes and uh, go ahead and ask your question. And uh, you guys have some back and forth dialogue. So like asking like one at a time. Like ask the first question, then he'll ask. Yeah. First you'll, question. you'll you'll go first, then him, then okay. you. Yeah. So my first question is, who has the ultimate interpretive authority in the church? And what I mean by that is someone's inter interpretation is binding on my conscience, whether or not I agree with it or not. Who has that final interpretive authority that it makes it binding on me as an individual? Well, so the, the interesting thing about that is that... Um, so if we have something, so, so I would say the question is a little bit like, when did you start, stop beating your wife? Almost like it's a leading question. The reason why I would say that um, is that every person has to interpret things. I have to interpret things. Even if I, even if you say the Catholic church, so in your case, if you were to say the Catholic church uh, is, is my, is the ultimate final infallible interpreter, even though they've like interpreted less than seven passages, I think it is. But anyways, that's another, another another topic. So they've only interpreted seven passages. They don't you don't have much interpretive authority there. But so you know, but so even if you were to say that's your final interpret interpretive authority is what the Roman Catholic Church says, the worry there is you're just pushing the problem back one. And what I mean by that is that you have to interpret interpret what the Roman Catholic Church's catechisms, what uh, you know, certain um, ex cathedra statements say, certain papal bulls, certain things like that. You're going to have to interpret those. And so at the end of the day, each person has to interpret. I can't interpret for you. You can't interpret for me because ultimately I'm kind of the base place of interpretation. Um, if you have someone else interpret for you, you have to interpret their statements of their interpretation. So I, I, I would say that each person has to interpret things. There's no way of escaping this uh, issue. Everybody has to make a fallible uh, interpretation of various texts um, at any point in time. So I would say that Protestants and Roman Catholics are in the same position that they are, they're, they're trying to interpret. In my case, I'm interpreting the Bible. In your case, you're interpreting the church and, and the Bible and under different circumstances. So yeah, that's how I'd understand that question. So you're saying that person, the individual is the final interpretive authority uh, when it comes to the scripture? Well, well yeah, because even if, if you have a second layer of interpretation, you have to interpret that. And that's fallible. That, you're not infallible, are you? 
No, I'm not infallible. I, I'm just saying. So you're fallible. So, yeah. Yeah. I'm. I'm. Yeah. <laughs> I wish I weren't fallible. But it, it, even even the fallibility, and when you talk about that, like what exactly is infallibility? Um, and that's when you talk about too, like inerrancy and 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 that you know infallibility and inerrancy and all that. That's when that comes in. That's a confusion. But I said as I would as a Catholic response, saying, listen. I am, I am looking, and, and like I said, I was a Protestant once. I was a Protestant. I became a Christian in 1988, August 28th, by the way, which is the feast of St. Augustine. Um, but I chose Anselm as my confirmation name. Anyway, I don't know why I did that. But uh, He's my I, favorite, uh, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, love, I was very into the scholastics when I was, when I was going through confirmation. Who could blame you? <laughs> but uh, I, 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 you know, in, in using my reason, I think your reason is, is you know, proper reason, proper, proper investigation. You know, I'm not saying that, the, that the, you know, your reason, you need, you know, special revelation to tell you to, to be a Protestant or Catholic. I'm saying is that as a Protestant, as a Protestant, I, I was a final authority. As a Catholic, I am not. Like if I, I basically sub, uh, submit myself to the teaching authority of the church and in, in accordance with that, is that if the church decides on a matter of with regard to the faith of the moral infallibly, whether or not I understand it, or whether or not at the time I fully accept it or, or, or agree with it, I submit to it. So it's different of, of, you know, as a Protestant, I would say I would not accept a view unless I truly understood it and agreed with it. And I would say even as a Protestant, in the in the you say six ecumenical councils so how, where, where is your what's your last one because <laughs> i want i'm just trying to see because they all say they all they all kind of some of them kind yeah, of i, I the dive off thing. i i dive off on the iconic iconoclast second, yeah, second, class, second second council of nicaea i don't agree with yeah um so i hold a regular so it, principle of worship because i hold the soul scriptura so yeah so even yeah. even yeah even there i would say you as a protestant would say that that i would even put put into questions things that were decided at a council if I disagree with it, like you disagree with Ephesus 2. You disagree with Ephesus 2 because you think it's not scriptural, even though the church universally accepts it since the beginning. So, or not since the beginning, but since in the order. Um, so I would say that even even, that, council, that is... even even councils are up to your interpretation. So you would even reject, so say like the council of... Um, I think Constantinople was the one that ratified uh, Ephesus, or, uh, Nicaea II. It's basically not Nicaea II, but the, the, the council that inserted the words at the end when we say the Nicene Creed that we believe in one holy and apostolic church. That was inserted at the, I, I, I got exactly where, but it's, in, it's the one that deals with the same one as Nicaea. I think that's Constantinople. But I, would, I don't, would, I don't, I don't disagree think that's with really that. the, I don't think that's really the issue though, because you're, you're not talking on this point here that I brought up is you say, no, I'm not the infallible, you know, I'm, I'm not the, I'm not the final interpretive authority the church is, but you're, you have the church here, which has, you believe is the property of infallibility. You are infallible. Okay. I believe that the Bible only has the property of being infallible. I am fallible. So we're just in the same position. And I, I mean, nothing you've said has, I, I don't, I don't not heard anything that addresses that very clear point that I'm infallible, you're fallible, you, we're both interpreting something that's infallible. I don't see any meaningful difference here, uh, even though you're saying it's a final interpretive authority. I could just say, you know what, scripture is the final interpretive authority. If you want to see, you know, you're saying the church is, I can just say that about scripture. I don't see any problem yeah, with that. But the, but the Bible and the church in church history, the councils, nowhere say that it's up to the individual. They know where say that. And they made declarations that were binding on individuals, even though maybe they didn't accept it. So, well, uh, so, so wait, I, I, to be clear, I think we need the church. The church is fallible uh, in, in, in its decisions, I think. I think people are fallible. It doesn't mean it's always wrong. I would say the church is generally reliable as your cognitive faculties are generally reliable, even though it's fallible. So I, I would say that we need the church. I don't make that decision alone, but I'm still using interpretation. I'm still fallible. I'm working with other fallible people. I need those people in my life to keep me accountable. I need the church and all those things. I'm not saying I'm doing it alone. Um, that I, I mean, it's, I'm doing it with somebody just like I, I need my, I needed my parents growing up. That doesn't mean my parents are infallible though. I didn't, I didn't parent myself, 
you know, my parents parented me, but they were fallible. And so, yeah, I would say the church is fallible and helps people uh, come to conclusions. You're always using your fallible interpretation process and that's, that's fine. But the, you know, our, your, your mind and my mind works well enough to where we can have a, a general level of confidence about what we're interpreting. So we feel pretty good about that. Um, so um, yeah, I would say, I would not say that I do it alone, um, but I mean, I'm the one that interprets things. You're the one that interprets things. And we use our best reason and judgment to come to those conclusions. And they're probably usually right. But be that as it may, we both do it. Yeah, well, how, but how was the church, how did the church handle that? How did the church handle individual interpretations throughout history, especially in the early church? We had all those heresies, like Arius had an had interpretation of the Bible. Pelagius did, Apollinaris did. All those guys used the Bible to support their views. So the church had to make a decision saying, listen, Pelagius, Arius, they, their views, their interpretation of scripture is invalid. It is not, it is not true. And, and this is what the church believes. And everybody has to accept it or they're ex cathedra and excommunicated. Yeah. So I would, I would say the church was right because they were following the Bible and the Holy Spirit was generally guiding the church to be reliable. So they, that's how they were able to make those helpful decisions based on scripture, based on reason. And God preserved his church. So I, I would I would have no problem with that. Um, I just don't ascribe the property of infallibility to the church. I only ascribe to the Bible. You're you're ascribing it to the church. Um, and I would say, I'm sure you would say the Bible too, because it's authorized by the church. But yeah. be that as it may, we're, we're both doing that. And so, yeah, I believe in church authority. So whenever you cite something on church authority, I'm like, cool, I, I agree with that. Um, I would, my, I tell my kids, listen to me every day. I mean, they don't listen to me very often, but I say, listen to me. They're, they're toddler. They're small, you know. So I tell them to listen to me, but I, I'm, I'm a, I'm a sinful, fallen human being. But I would still say I'm generally reliable as a father. So I just think the church has the same function. I'm not saying we do it alone, like on a desert island, me and my King James Bible, you know, you know, alone in isolation. No, we need the church. The Bible teaches we need the church. I just don't ascribe the property of infallibility to the church. I say it's fallible, like I'm a fallible dad. So what I've, I'm going to say, so I can sum up what you're saying is I, I will accept the authority of the church insofar as that church, ex, it, it, it's, it's so, insofar as I agree with it. So I, I, would, I would accept uh, the, the church uh, insofar as it's reasonable. Yeah, it's reasonable to me. What else is it? You'd pick the Roman Catholic Church because it was reasonable to you. You didn't pick Sede Vacantis. You didn't pick the Eastern Orthodox Church. You didn't pick the Mormons. You know, you, you you picked the Roman Catholic Church because it was reasonable to you. You're doing the same thing I'm doing. So I don't see any substantial difference here. I just think my my choice has has a better pedigree. So yeah, I know. Th th then we're back to that. Then so so now we're we pushed it back to that. Okay. So so who has a better evidence, right? Mm -hmm. And um, you know, I, if I if I thought your arguments were good, I wouldn't. I don't think I'd be Roman Catholic. I'd probably go with Jerry Mattatix and be a Senate of the Cantus because I do think Florence contradicts the the, the current. Roman view. So, I mean, I think Jerry Mattatix is right. I think there's a clear contradiction there. So I would say um, the seat is vacant. So, I mean, you know, it doesn't, you know, so there's different views of, of church authority. Yeah. You've got the Oriental Orthodox, you've got the Eastern Orthodox, you got the Roman Catholics. You, you know, I'll, I'll, got, address, I'll address that in your, in your question. Your last yeah. question to me deals with that. So you're right. Good, good point. I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah, that's right. So yeah, is it now your turn? I, I hope was, I don't know maybe that was my <laughs> first question. I mean, um, it, you actually you got you got ten minutes left. Uh, if you want to keep going on this question, Dennis, or if you just want to forgo your ten minutes. No, no, no. I think I think he answered his question. The question. So yeah. Okay. Yep. All right, Nate. Um, your question for Dennis, and uh, you can take twenty minutes, and uh, we'll start now. Yeah. So this is just with regard to my. Um, opening statement um that's what the question is regard to so pull it up so yeah um so just you know how do you respond to the arguments uh from scripture the what i gave the the tradition traditional argument the common sense argument uh in my opening statement so you can just go through each one and we can have a conversation about my, my opening statement so we can you know start interacting on that so um now to yeah, be honest so yeah, it's, yeah so, so go ahead <laughs> yeah i know i, I should have open that differently um yeah so first corinthians 4 6 so the greek word gagraphitai there um how do you what do you take a graphitai to mean 
Well, I, I could say what you say it means with, and still not be not be in a bad position. I I think that like with Calvin, Calvin basically said, listen, it can mean a couple of things. It can mean what Paul wrote, or it can mean what he wrote in this letter. It can so if when you're expanding the meaning of a word, then basically you're you're kind of bringing you're bringing a baggage into that word and making it say more than what it was meant to say. Because when you look at uh, Second Thessalonians, Paul is talking or uh, Paul talks about except you know you accept what I what we taught you our traditions either by word of mouth or orally or written. So he's he's basically saying there are he he taught them with his mouth, but he also sent letters because that was the only mode of communication outside of communication with the mouth that he had. So like I said before, I I believe and and historically you can see this is that the scriptures that we have, you know, there's the story of Jesus, the gospels, the book of Acts, which is a history, but after the book of Acts, these are letters until you get to the revelation. Um, these are letters by Paul to people he's built relationships with, the churches he's established, kind of re retouching base. So when Paul was writing the, uh, his letters, I, I, I don't think he was thinking, you know what, I'm doing this because eventually this is going to be made into a book that's going to be the only authority that people that will, you know, three or 400 or a thousand years from now are going to turn to, that's going to be their rule, their rule. I, I think that the Bible and the way, and, and you look at the way it came about, like how the Bible was, was brought about, like I said, there were books that were in question. And even Martin Luther said that he didn't like some of the books that were included in the canon, like James. And I would say he reason why he thought that was because James says, you know, Man, you know we are saying so you're you're going quite <laughs> yeah. a bit off the topic uh, what, here. What, I'm, what i'm saying is that yeah is that the, the way you look at the history of the canon and the way you look at how things came to be obviously paul's not just talking about you know what was written because there was so actual we're so so you actually you said that you can agree with me and actually you can't agree with me because graphitai as most scholars vast majority of new testament scholars recognize today 30 times that means scripture so it doesn't mean like some narrow sense of something you've, I don't know, I don't understand what you're, what you're going there. Not what Calvin thought it meant either. The, the, the studies we're, we're getting from the Graphitae is clear that it's always used as scripture. Every single instance, about 30 times in Paul's writings. And it actually says the scripture that you may know the, the expression not to go with what is written. So the definite article is used not as quoting scripture, but as a phrase, a well-known catchphrase. That's how the definite article is used there in Greek. So it's saying that you may learn the, 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 the well-known saying, don't go beyond scripture. So it's not citing Old Testament stuff. It's, it's giving a general statement saying, don't go beyond scripture. And that is, as I say, the majority usage of, of the graphitai. And I think you, what you try to do here is you try to go to 2 Thessalonians 2, talk about, uh, you know, uh, that was oral or written. And I would just say, hey, you know, listen to the sermons. If I was talking, this is how the, the, the Greek um, either or is used there. In that in that sentence, it's like saying, "I listen to my to um, my my preaching, whether it's written or whether I or whether it's oral." Um, and so that doesn't mean that con there's two separate contents out there that's floating around some oral tradition. It just means no that that I'm I'm expressing the same mode of communication through two different means. Verbally, the word of God was Paul was inspired and he was an inspired apostle, and it was through written written uh, a discourse. So that that's all that means. And even even um, 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 Oh, I'm trying to remember his name. He's a he's a priest. Um, uh, it's supposed to be my my mind right now. Um, but um, even even Catholics will say that that the 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 the, the passed down teaching there is is a gospel. So I mean, um, the teaching that Paul is referring to is a gospel, whether it's it's written or whether it's an oral form. Well, I would just say in this case, I Father Pacwa, Father Pacwa. I, I I agree. I agree with Calvin. <laughs> Well, so I'm that, just, that, that, I, I'm that's just, great because I, because well, well, Calvin just, what wasn't infallible. So I'm, I mean, I'm just, I'm he's just wrong saying, about a lot of things. And the thing is, I, I think I, there's a case that can be made that that Paul was only referring to what he was writing in First Corinthians, like th that he, that that can be made there because he's not he doesn't go on and and, and, and exact you know extrapolate. And like I said, Luther is silent, and Calvin says it's not a big deal. Okay, okay that's, I, 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 why do I, why, why would I care what Luther and Calvin say? I mean, I'm, well, they, they're I'm, the... I'm, I'm, I'm giving you, I'm giving you a biblical argument here and you're appealing to what people said 500 years ago. 
um, and not up with the recent scholarship on this. So, I mean, that's great, but that's what we've looked at by doing. We have computers now that can do lexical studies and we can determine what words mean with much more precision and accuracy than they knew 500 years ago. I don't, I don't have any problem with that. I don't agree with Calvin on a lot of things. I agree with him on probably 90% of things, but I mean, I, I, I mean, I read any person I read, I'm going to have, you know, general agreement, but I'm never going to have hundred percent agreement unless it's the Bible. So, I mean, you know, you look at the, the, the evidence here in New Testament scholarship, graphic time means scripture. So I don't think you've dealt with that. You've tried to appeal to Calvin and Luther, which I don't agree with Luther on well, everything. I don't agree with Calvin and everything. And then you try to go to second Thessalonians too. And I, I, I don't think that that um, addresses it from my vantage, but maybe I'm misunderstanding you. I would agree with your interpretation if Sola Scriptura or, or that view was created in the 20th century. But the fact that the founders of Protestantism, Calvin and Luther, who formulated the doctrine of Sola Scriptura, didn't use it. So those guys would be the authorities in terms of the doctrine they formulated, whether or not you say they rediscovered it from the Bible or, or what have you, they're the guys that you turn to because they're the ones that formulated it. Not some 20th century biblical scholar on, or, or Greek scholar, uh, you know, 400 years later. I mean, if you're talking about the weight of someone's view, if someone is saying, look, I, you know, Luther stands before the Diet of Worms and says, my conscience is held captive, I can do no other. If he says that, and that's because of the, the word of God held him captive, then I would think he would say, listen, it says here in uh, 1 Corinthians 4, 6. Why? why? <laughs> it's the thing. Well, they, 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 mean, didn't, they didn't use it. Yeah. So, I mean, you're going on about this, but what I would just say is quite simply, I don't think 1 Corinthians 4, 6 is the only way you get to Sola Scriptura. That's just, that just happens to be one of the clearest ways. There's many ways you get there, um, I think. So, I mean, I'm not saying that this is the one verse that proves it. I think, I think it's a cumulative case. I think it's a really good cumulative case. You use multiple parts of a case to strengthen it. But I, I think you come up with soul scripture before, you know, scholarship. I'm just saying now it's clearer than ever. That's what I'm saying. It was always clear, just got even clearer. So, I, I mean, I, you know, I don't, I don't have to agree with Luther and Calvin in every single interpretation. I mean, I, I'm not a Roman Catholic. I don't, Calvin's not my pope, but neither is Martin Luther. So I, you know, I, I have no problem disagreeing with them, and uh, I'm just going with what the mainstream is understanding. Gagraphitai, it's it's used throughout. You can do a word study on yourself and see, and look at Leon Morris's commentary on it. I mean, that's it's very it's out there. So um, yeah, I, I don't, I don't, I don't see how you've dealt with that particular argument. I'm, I'm saying that to be focused. We can go to Acts 17 after the semester on with that and yeah. go over my argument from reason and all that kind of stuff. Um, but that's, but like you know. Okay, I'm sorry. Well, I, yeah, I'm just saying, I mean, no, no, no offense, but regarding Sola Scriptura and what it means, I'm going to stick with Calvin and Luther rather than people that exist in the 20th century. That's, that's just what I would do. Like I said, there are other verses out there that I think are better or more, more equipped to, to, to tackle this. I just think 1 Corinthians 4, 6 is not one of them. So you're just going to stick with Calvin and Luther because they're, they're, they're older or something. Okay. No, because they if, if, that, if, if that's your, if, if that's your reason, then I'm, I'm satisfied to continue on. Okay. Um, that's cool. Yeah. Um, how are we doing on time, Devin, by the way? Yeah, we're, we're good. Um, Dennis, Dennis, just because there seemed to be some, some, some confusion. So Dennis is um, saying not that he's going with Calvin and Luther because they're older, but Dennis, um, you're saying that because, in your view, Calvin and Luther invented Sola Scriptura. Is that correct? Oh. Well, I, well, well, I would say that, it, you know, if you use the word invented, I mean, I would say it's an innovation because I don't think it's, it's present. I don't think yeah. it's present in the in the Bible or history before that. But I'm saying is that, whether regard just regardless of the side you're on, they formulated it first. So See, uh, they they okay. they, they have they have yeah. first dibs. How about that? Okay, you, you know that's that that that's helpful. I don't think that obviously, so I don't agree with you on that. Okay. Um, I, I, I think it's an, I think it's early church stuff um, by the quotes I gave, you know, it's the, the, it says scripture alone. Do you, have, do you have early church? Do you have early church evidence that they've thought that of that verse? Uh, no, not of that particular verse. Uh, but, you know, you don't have early church uh, verses on, on anything that's infallibly defined. It's all fallible. You only have seven verses that are defined. So, I mean, it wouldn't matter what the church father says, because according to the catechism of the Catholic Church, uh, a tradition can be changed, modified or abandoned. So. 
you just go by what the church says, no matter what the church fathers say, uh, because you don't you don't have any any evidence of I would say the Mary ascending into heaven from any of the early church fathers in the first uh, three hundred years. So, I mean, we're kind of in the same boat there. So, I mean, yeah, I, you know, I, 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 yeah. So, so basically, my my choices are because uh, I have. Well, I mean, until until I do the study, uh, it, it's it's well, eventually it's myself. But uh, so it's Luther, Calvin, you. Or, or some biblical scholars of the 20th century that talked about this word that you go, don't have any proof that it was taught this way in the early church because they didn't talk about it or you don't know. I mean, it's a mystery. Um, what I'm saying is that if, if the early church taught that about that verse, I would say I would give a little more credence, credence to it. Uh, because but you, of, wouldn't, because you, wouldn't know, you wouldn't know it infallibly because again well, I, I don't have to know it infallibly to know a good argument oh well i mean hey we're we're, we're agreed on that then yeah <laughs> you know? that's fine so, yeah. <laughs> um yeah you don't have to know things infallibly. Yeah, yeah okay well that's great yeah. so so you can go off fallible authorities as i can and um you just go to the church for your final authority go to the bible yeah. and that's that's really the difference i think and i would say yeah now you're you're in that position in a lot of different ways with mary ascending into heaven uh not dying um i i don't think there's anything in the first 300 years of that so i mean well, well, Hold, hold on, you, you go, you, you stop with the, your interpretation of the church, your interpretation of the scripture is the final authority, not the scripture. That, that's well, because so, that's so, we, so that's do you with the church? Have. Yeah, I would say you do the same thing with the church. You, yeah, you, I'm just saying, yeah, I do, I do, but the church we, we, we both do it. has a better pedigree, that's all. Well, I, I, I think the earliest documents have the best, and that's that goes back to my other argument that we we're discussing. Um, yeah, I mean, that if we're going to figure out what a certain person thinks, we're going to go to the earliest documents and they're going to take primacy. Um, yeah, that's how people do history today. Yeah, but like I said, the Bible's not a catechism, and it's also not like the Didache, which is like a, a, a book that tells you certain things you're going to do. It's like I said, it's written. There are letters. There are encouragements. There's things that need to be interpreted, and proof in the you know from Saint Vincent were interpreted incorrectly that led to possible schisms in the early church. Um, like I'm a history. Uh, uh, I study history. The Visigoths that ruled Spain were Aryans. Like the whole area of Spain was Aryan. So they were, they were, they were wrong. So that, that was an issue that was dealt with and, and addressed, you know, and, and there was still an issue even after Nicaea because the Aryans kept on until they, were, until they were conquered and wiped out by the Muslims. But anyway, that's a tangent. What I'm saying is that, is that the church has made declarate, has declared certain things closed. So no yeah, 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 there's parts of the catechism that may, might interpret differently. Um, but so I would say that the, the church authority having, you know, if, if you hold your view, we inter take your interpretation of history, infallible churches hasn't done anything to create any sort of unity. Um, you have to interpret it. And that's why 70% of Roman Catholics don't hold the transubstantiation. That's why you have a schism in the year, around the year 1000 with the Oriental Orthodox. You have another schism. Um, actually, no, that was earlier. I'm sorry. That's 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 uh, that was at Chalcedon, um, um, the fifth century. So you have the Oriental Orthodox. Then then you have the Eastern Orthodox splitting. So this is what the infallible church. You have all these schisms. Yeah. You've not prevented yourself from schisms. And so not only do you have infallible churches disagreeing, but then within your own ranks, seventy percent. Of, I mean, the sacraments are huge in Roman Catholicism, especially when you talk about the view of transubstantiation. 70% don't believe in America in transubstantiation. I would not say that about evangelicals. I would say about 90% believe in justification by faith alone. So there's much more unity, and I don't even have an infallible church. We're, we're interpreting the Bible. And when you go interpret uh, the infallible church, you can interpret uh, the worship of the same God as the Muslims different interpretations on that, right? How do you understand tradition and oral tradition and scripture? Different interpretations on that. So I think we got the same problem here and to try to obfuscate it as if we don't, I think is, I think is a, is to misunderstand what's going on. Well, but can I respond to that? Cause I, I want to say sure. first off yeah. that thank God that the Catholic church is not a democracy because all churches have idiots in them. So that just because churches have dumb people in them doesn't mean the church is false right? And the church has had dumb people in it since the beginning. Jesus even promised there'd be dumb people in church. So it's not a democracy. Second, if I have a tree in my front yard and I prune the branches, I still have a tree, even if it has no branches or even if it has missing one branch or a branch falls off. 
it's still a tree. It's still my tree. So because there's schemat schismatics, people walk away. They still have free will. They still have minds. They still have, uh, you know, their conscience too. If they walk away, they have that free will to do so. Jesus didn't sounds promise. Like, yeah. yeah, sounds like you and me have the same problem. You yeah, know, I mean, I'm just saying, yeah, yeah. The, the church, like I said, the church is not a democracy. The, 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 the key here is, is that what, what is the church and that, in that you want to belong to the true one. And like I said in my opening statement, Calvin and Luther, mostly Calvin, they redefined what a church was. They said, they said, they said what the church was, was where the gospel was truly preached and where the sacraments were truly administered. That word truly it was up to them to determine that word truly. That was not what the church has ever defined itself as being. The historical definition of the church is one, holy, and apostolic. That's the definition of the church. I, so, I would agree with that. <laughs> but Calvin and Luther, they redefined well, it, to, it, give them, it to give themselves the ability to, to, to be an authority over what they, what they decided they wanted to do and when they went with their conscience. Well, I, I don't think, I think they're teachers. I don't think they have um, authority. I mean, Calvin had authority in his church, but I don't think, you know, Calvin has some sort of special authority from like, you know, someone like Turretin or Greg Bonson or something like that. I think they're teachers that can be learned from. We can learn from them. Um, but I don't give, I don't give them super special status as you seem to be doing. Um, I think they were wrong about things and uh, I, the true church, I mean, is just divine it, it many, it, all, I mean, evangelicals I talk to, I mean, they all say the same thing. I'm like, Catholics with transubstantiation, they all pretty much say, you know, it's before the church is believers, you know, the universal mystical body of Christ is, it's one and uh, it's connected. It's not, it's not maybe institutionally like uh, connected, but I don't think that's what makes a church. So I think we have different definitions of church here. Well, I would say too, that we're not doing exactly the same thing, because like I said before, you, if you disagree with the church, if you say, you know, if you're, if you become, God forbid, Armenian, <laughs> you would leave your church. You would go somewhere else and you'd be a different, you pastor. You became a sad of the cantus. You would leave your church. If you what became saying, Eastern Orthodox, you would leave your church. What I'm saying is that even, even, even though I may not understand or agree with the Roman Catholic church, the church's pronouncements are binding on my conscience. They, it basically means I have no choice to disagree. I would say that only about the Bible. But you see, at the end of the day, this just church thing. Uh, you, if you disagree with the Roman Catholic Church, you could become a. Nothing's going to stop you from being a Sedebicantus. Nothing's going to stop you from me being an Eastern Orthodox or Oriental Orthodox, or like uh, any type of the Orthodox. There is there's actually different types. <laughs> it's amazing how many there are. So I mean, yeah, nothing. Nothing's going to stop you from doing those things. Uh, if you wanted, to, if you were persuaded by the infallible LDS Church, as they claim to have prophets, you know. Well, get to that. Well, like I said, we'll get to that question yeah. eventually because I, I sure. have okay. an answer for that. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, I'm just saying that all I'm doing is saying you and I, we're, we're in the same boat here uh, on, on these issues. And so we have to look at the specific biblical arguments uh, here and, and analyze them. And I think when you have the biblical arguments, we're going to go with the earliest documents to figure out Christian doctrine. Um, and I have to interpret those, but you have to interpret the catechism um, bowls. You have to interpret um, creeds, confessions, ec ecumenical councils. You have to interpret all those things. And those things, I've read them. Not always easy. Nope. Especially, especially when you have Catholics interpret the catechism of the Catholic church in fundamentally different ways. It's, it's really interesting. So what I would say is that you ascribe the property of infallibility of the church. I ascribe it to the Bible. You both fallibly interpret it, and uh, there's no leg up here. Well, let, right, let me guys, ask. Let me, yeah, so, let me ask one, uh, one follow-up question. So, so when so when yeah, you're yeah. a pastor in your church and you have an interpretation of the scriptures, mm -hmm. are your congregants uh, bound in their conscience to agree with you? I would say yes, that because I have general reliability, um, and I would say just like you're you're bound to follow your mind because it is general reliability. You trust it. It's it's accrued that and everything. So. I would say yes, but I don't have infallible authority. They, they read their Bibles at home and they give it. I had a woman recently show me I was wrong about something and I changed my view. She used a Bible to do it. Um, and so I, I said, oh, you know what? You're right. That was a good point. But to change my views because it didn't reflect the Bible it happens all the time because I'm constantly learning. Um, but I would say I have general reliability about doctrine. And so generally I have that kind of authority as a parent has authority because of, uh, of they have more knowledge and studying than, than their, their child. 
So I would say, I would tell my, tell any kid in church, listen to your parents. They, but I don't think their parents are infallible. Yeah, I just think there's a difference between uh, interpreting ancient documents like the Bible and a living authority in the church. Like the church not, is an authority. It's, it's not a living authority because you can't have a conversation with anybody who's infallible. It's not really living. It's just statements that are made and you have to interpret them. No one's going to help you guide. No one's going to talk to you and guide you through that. That's infallible. There's a priest, a bishop, individuals, just as fallible as any guy. I mean, so I, I don't, I mean, and the statements are not clear or helpful or enlightening to me. I've read them. I, I mean, I, I have numerous contradictions that you can, and things you can interpret out of the way in the catechism of the Catholic church. It's, it's pretty tough to read. All right, Dennis, your turn for your second question, and you have 20 minutes. For him to respond? Is that, is that where we're... He, he has 20 minutes to respond to my question, right? Well, yeah, you're going to ask the question, and then you guys will have a 20-minute discussion. It's, it's your second question now. I guess this kind of hits on what we're talking about. <laughs> I guess I think all mine are the, maybe the same little note here, but it says, what should be the outcome when private judgment and the church's interpretation, or your church's interpretation, collide. Yeah. Well, um, I would, I would, uh, I would say the same thing that happened in the first century with the Bereans. Um, they would check out, check, check the teacher out, and to see if they're, if they're teaching the truth, um, just like the Bereans did, you know. Um, so I would, I, I would say that I would be a good Berean to stick with the Scripture as the ultimate authority. Um, but I, I, you know, I would use church tradition to help aid me and to guide me as I would use my parents for advice on, on things. I would use teachers in the church and I would use uh, church fathers and councils to help me come to these conclusions. But I, I would use it all in conversation with scripture so that when I look at scripture, when something's clear, so if the father, if the father's you know, united and say the Trinity is false or God doesn't exist, then I would say like, look, I'm reading the scripture here. It's very clear God exists. It's very clear the Trinity is taught here. And so I would then overturn the fathers on that. Um, uh, so uh, yeah, that's, that's how I would handle it. Uh, is I would say that I would use the church and tradition and teachers to help me interpret it. At the end of the day, if they said something that was just bonkers false, I would go with the earliest documents because they're the earliest and they have that intuitive uh, credibility about them. Um, it's just, you believe them because of the, the earliest we have. And that's where we should go to, to adjudicate disputes. So what would say, so say you had someone in your congregation came to you with James 2, 24 mm -hmm. and says, it's clearly states here that James is saying that you are justified by works and not by faith alone. Yeah. Faith so of he, demons. And he, and he felt, he felt. Demonic his, faith. <laughs> he, he felt in his conscience that works are a part of his salvation. What would, well, what would be the um, outcome there? Yeah, I mean, it, it, the, 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 it's the faith of demons that's talked about. Demons don't have any, you know, uh, I mean, no one thinks that you're justified by a, a faith that's similar to that of a demon. Um, as James chapter two says, um, the demons believe and then they shudder. I mean, no one says the faith that justifies a person is demonic um you know so i would say that clearly you read the context is talking about something different it's talking about when we're looking at a person's life they say they're you know they walk down the aisle and prayed the prayer or whatever it is um you know and they live like a demon that's a faith of demons it's not it's not a legit faith that just that means that basically that 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 person never received christ's righteous and never had true saving faith there's smoke there's fire there's no smoke there so there's no fire kind of thing so that's what james is talking about i would agree in that context yeah you know you're 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 showing you're showing to have a right faith not by the mere assertion of it but by works you need you need works with that otherwise you faith is illegitimate i, well, I mean i'd agree with james yeah so he'd say that with the friends of justification faith alone uh you would he would say that he, he works are part of his his uh, his justification no, because that's not what James, James is talking about someone having a faith of demons. It's a totally different context than Paul. Paul's talking about someone who has a true, genuine faith that's reborn by the Holy Spirit. He's not talking about someone having a demonic, the faith that, that evil, you know, uh, you know, demonic hordes have. I mean, if, if you think that Paul is using faith in Romans 3 and 4, the same as the demonic hordes, 
I, I don't know. Yeah, it's pretty clear that it's not, right? So James, if James is talking about the faith of demons and Paul is talking about a faith that justifies you, uh, when you're, you know, even though you're ungodly, it justifies you and there's this transformation that occurs after that. I, I think those are totally different things. So, I mean, uh, Protestants have never said that the, the faith of a demon, if you have a demon-like faith, that that, res, that, that that is ever a legitimate faith in, in someone's life. Someone who is justified by faith alone, there will be, there, there, there'll be a change in their life, they'll, they'll, their new creation. If that's not manifest, then yeah, I mean, I would say, you know, you say you believe in Jesus alone, but there's no works in your life. You're not, you're, you're not sure your faith is not shown to be right by the mere assertion of it, not by you saying it's by faith alone, but by works. So I would agree with James. I mean, in a real practical level that, that it, it, there has to be an, an external manifestation of change or else the person has a faith like a demon. They just, you know, shudder. I mean, it's, it's, it's not worth anything. Yeah, I would say that I would I would not necessarily agree with the whole like demonic faith because I think demons like they don't have the same uh, properties as a person where they where they don't know what's going on because they they they're in the spirit world so they they know God exists they're not like you know they're not in this side of the veil where we we have uh, we don't have that direct knowledge so I don't Romans exactly one says we all do Romans one says we all do I'm saying that like we're a different ontological category than demons uh, in that regard. Uh, well, I mean, James feels fit to, to compare them. I have no issue with that basic reading of the text. And uh, Romans 1 says all people know God. All people, all people believe in God. And they suppress that truth and unrighteousness. They know God. Um, yeah. And that so, also, James I mean, Re I mean there, yeah, there's... James, James referenced Abraham's yeah. too, Abraham's faith. And I don't yeah. think Abraham has a demonic faith in that regard. Yeah, he was, he was told as a person who has the right type of faith. His faith is shown to be right by his works. And I would say that I would say, yeah, your, your faith is not justified and shown to be right just by the mere st saying of it, but by works. That's what he's and saying. Like said, and like I said, there's also like verses like, you know, John six, where it talks about Jesus's body and his eating his flesh. I'm saying that this person believes this thing. So what what does the person do when he disagrees with you? And he says, listen, well, I'm sorry, I, the John, the John six is lost on me. I, I, I lost you there. I'm sorry. I'm saying where, where, where Jesus talks about his body being true, true flesh and his blood being being uh, blood to drink. And where us Catholics kind of when we have a scriptural verse referring to the real presence and transubstantiation and communion, that 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 is very clear that Jesus is talking not metaphorically because people walk away. But I'm saying the person who comes to you and says, I have a trouble. I have trouble with this, with, with what you believe in my conscience, what. What happens when they collide? Are they supposed to accept your authority or are they supposed to accept their own and, and walk away? Um, yeah, they're, they're, they're to accept my author, authority as someone who, who studied and knows the Bible would say that they're, they're to accept that because it's, it's reason based. It's based not on sheer, you know, pulling your rank, but because of, of me having being, being reliable, me being selected by God. Like the uh, like the like the authorities in Romans 14 are generally selected. They're generally reliable to be in that spot and to make judgments about who should you know be executed, excuse me, and who shouldn't. So I would say generally God's put me in that place, and I would say also that uh, m you know my knowledge base, you know, or any pastor's knowledge base, which is you know you know they go to seminary for these things and they're tested. So I would say they have that general I'm not just saying like I'm the greatest guy in the world where you should listen to me, you know, I'm so smart, you know. I'm just saying that any pastor should be respected and and be listened to unless and until they explicitly contradict the word of God and that can be shown. On the John 6 passage I don't think that can be shown. Um it says the spirit uh it, spirit gives life the flesh is of of, of no worth, of no value. So the words I've spoken to you are spirit and life. So he's clearly talking about, I think he's talking about the real presence there, but I don't think it's a fleshly carnal sort of thing because he denies that and they still walk away because they don't like his sayings. So um, yeah, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't think that proves transubstantiation at first, but we can go on about that later. I have, um, I, 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 I don't think it's a, it's, a, it's a literal, I don't think no one, I don't think Catholics take it literally enough, but that's another issue there. Well, what I was saying though is that if that person is is a, thinks that they have the proper interpretation of Scripture, mm -hmm. and it disagrees with yours, they're supposed to accept your authority generally, even though it's against their conscience. Just just like you would have a parent or a governing authority, but 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 what what is when when Paul is given a wrong declaration from a governing authority, so we'd rather listen to God rather than man. 
that's the same attitude people should have towards me. And then eventually, if they can't reconcile that, are you saying they're supposed to stay in your church? If they can't reconcile that, they show that God has said this, and I'm saying something different, then they should do what Peter said to a governing authority. We'd rather obey God rather than man. Because, you know, we're supposed to follow general authorities. It says that, but you don't think, you don't think the, the general authorities are fallible. You think they have authority, so do I. But they don't have a fallible authority, but we would respect them and honor them. But they can walk away, is what I'm saying. They, they, can, they can leave your church and, and deny your authority. Uh, they can, but they can do that with any church, Roman Catholic, Eastern Orthodox, Oriental, it just doesn't matter. Okay. That's my, that, that, that's what I, that's what I wanted to, that's my question. All right. Um, Nate, you will go ahead and you can start okay. with the second question. All right. So, um, Oh, we're, we're at the one <laughs> we've been talking about the whole time. We're running around. We've been circling the, you know, around. now we're here, Dennis. Um, <laughs> um, no, thank you for, uh, being such a good discussion partner. I appreciate you, you know, no, remember I, I was reformed at one time. So I, when I first met Matt Graham, he can attest to this. We talked, and I think I mentioned to you on our phone call the other day, we talked about predestination and Calvinism for th for six months straight every day wow <laughs> yeah I, I studied that in graduate school and i you know after about a year i'm like i don't know if i want to get a phd in philosophy and study compatibilism i think i'm bored of this so i'll come and, i'll and, be a pastor and, well, well, and whatever what, you know and one, of the guys that, all yeah, things, you know? and one of the guys that disagreed with me vehemently my friend tony lombardo uh he eventually became a calvinist and now he's a presbyterian pastor so he's where i was like 25 years ago so you know, eventually, takes... I think in 25 years, he'll be a Catholic. <laughs> Interesting. Well, that's, a, that's an assessment of the situation right there. Um, <laughs> that's my hope. Yeah. Oh, sure. Um, so my second question is, so out of all the different churches out there, you know, you got um, different churches claim to be infallible. You've got numerous Pentecostal, you know, cults. They're not Assemblies of God, the Orthodox Pentecostals that I, I grew up in, which is great. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, you've got like, Pentecostal cults that claim to have apostles and bishops, people that speak for God. So you have many infallible churches, probably, I don't even know, probably well over like a thousand, you know, in the South, you know, or whatever. So you got many infallible churches. You got the Mormons, you got the Jehovah's Witnesses, you got all those Eastern Orthodox breakoffs, and you got the Senate of Acantus. So, you know, you, you, you had to make a choice to follow Rome. So why did you choose it? Well, funny, that was actually my, my sponsor, David Hunter. He actually asked me that in the elevator one day. And he's a patristic scholar. And so he's like, listen, why are you becoming Catholic and not Orthodox? He actually asked me for a blank. And I'm like, do you ask everybody in RCA this question? Like, <laughs> I was like, that's, that was a different. So, so my, my, my answer to that is LDS and those, those Protestant or rest restorationist movements, I reject because they don't have apostolic succession. The churches that can trace themselves back to the apostles and have apostolic succession I believe are valid, and so does the Catholic Church. It's that they are in, they are not in full communion, and therefore they they are not fully, they're not fully part of us, but they're also not fully separated either. But they do have valid holy orders, they have valid sacraments, which are seven, like us, um, and, and valid ordination, which infers again the apostolic succession. And what I'd like to do here is, is that it just emphasize this is that in 2007. Catholics and Orthodox met at Ravenna. I don't know if you heard about this. They made a joint declaration about what Catholics and Orthodox, and we accept, and also those excommunications are no longer in place, uh, what were happening. And, and like I said, there's a big history between Orthodox and Catholic, and it's not just theological. So like in, tw in 1204, yeah. there was a, there was the, the, the Latin kingdom of Constantinople, which I think that was more of a, of a, of a, of a, of a tearing or of a, of an issue than say the filioqua. I think that there, that the filioqua could have been worked out uh, historically if, if that, you know, if we at the crusaders hadn't conquered uh, Constantinople, but that's, that's a history question, but yeah, but so, just, so, let me, just let me quote, let me yeah. just quote the, the, the council of this, this document between the officials of the Orthodox and the officials of the Catholic church. They said, authority within the Catholic Church is upon a word of God, 
present and alive in the community of the disciples. Scripture is reveal, is the revealed word of God as the church through the Holy Spirit, present and active within, has discerned as the living tradition received from the apostles. At the heart of this tradition is the Eucharist. The authority of Scripture derives from the fact that it is the word of God which, read in the church and by the church, transmits the gospel of salvation. Through Scripture, Christ addresses the assembly, assembled community, and the heart of each believer. The church, through the Holy Spirit, present within, authentic, authentically interprets the scriptures, responding to the needs and times and places. The constant custom of the church to enthrone the gospels in the, uh, hold on a second, in the assembly, both attest to the presence of Christ in his word, which is necessary, which is necessary point of reference for all their discussions and decisions, and at the same time affirms the authority of the church to interpret the word of God. So that statement between the Orthodox and the Roman Catholics agree on my position. Because like I said, they both have, they both have valid um, uh, apostolic succession. So I, they're a valid church to me. You, and you, can't, you can't take communion there, though, in the Orthodox church. Well, the Orthodox can take communion with us. Yeah, but, but, there's, but there's not, there's not a, you guys are the same churches, though. Like I said, I, and then they and they and they deny the filioque. I, I mean, I know yeah. Orthodox. I mean, they really deny the divine, deny absolute simplicity. And, and, all those it, things. It also, it also different views it, of God, essence, energy distinction. I it, mean, you also, have a different different God and a, and a and a and a and a different view of the Trinity than Eastern Orthodox. You and I probably have more in common with the Trinity than oh, an Eastern Orthodox Christian. Well, let, let me just say that there are Eastern Catholics that are Orthodox in practice and doctrine. That are in communion with the bishop of rome you can go to any yeah. eastern catholic church today and and they when they say that i see creed they will not say the filioqua so there is still those churches that are orthodox within so there are 22 uh, rites within the catholic church the latin rite is just one and the biggest so and also these orthodox churches they don't disagree with the primacy of rome they disagree on the supremacy and how that's worked out historically but they accept that Rome has the primacy. So yeah, but that's, that still doesn't get around the Sede Cantus arguments from the contradictions of Florence with the current uh, creeds. But be that as it may, um, I talked to and Orthodox even, man. Yeah. I, I, I talked to Orthodox, and man, they would you 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 paint a I would say a very optimistic, rosy picture from the Orthodox guys I talked to, which would say some pretty intense things, and Orthodox priests, which would say some pretty intense things. So I don't think that unity is painted there. I can take a communion at a Baptist uh, and uh, any non-denominational church down the road, whatever it is. I mean, I, I could go down and take communion with those. I'd say they're true, true churches, but you can't take communion in an Eastern Orthodox church. Well, I said I mean, we're, not, we're not we're not in full communion. No, so you're I not. said I said that we, that's why we're not in full communion. What I'm saying, you ask me why I'm Catholic and not Orthodox. I'm telling you that I believe those churches have valid ordination and apostolic succession. So they are valid churches. So I don't disagree with their essential authority as an apostolic church. And so that, that, that's what I'm replying to you. But they teach contradictory things to what you believe. They believe in the essence energy distinction. I, you, Catholics don't believe in that. You, well, you yeah, believe I, in divine simplicity. They don't believe in that. So, so I, I guess like, so if, you, if they both have equal authority in your eyes, then you're going to have a contradiction on with that. Um, I, I'm not saying I didn't say they have equal authority. I say they have valid, they have valid apostolic succession. I believe the Catholic Church has ultimate authority, and the Roman Catholic Church and the Pope do. So there's a disagreement, obviously, but that doesn't mean they're not valid churches that have apostolic succession and can trace themselves back to the apostles. They do. They also agree with us about how the Bible is to be read and interpreted. So the way we do it, the form we do it, the way, and also the way they practice their faith in terms of like their sacraments and you know, uh, deification and all that, that is, that is a dialogue we're having, but it's not, it doesn't say between two of us, you're not a valid apostolic uh, church. The Eastern Orthodox would say the Pope has authority over the West. That's, that's what they would say about the Pope's authority. He is a Bishop of the West. He does not have authority over us. He has primacy in the fact that he is founded upon Peter. And then they would say also Paul, but he does not have supremacy, and like I said, yeah. we're working on that. That's something. We're but you, but you on hold together. different views of different views of God, but yeah, they're legitimately. So yeah, so why do you? 
you know, it's it's so interesting that. So like, why but, why why do so I, yeah. I I am a Catholic because I I agree with the Catholic side of this 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 internal debate. <laughs> it's it's a debate which went with us. It's not a debate that is settled from without. And obviously, people are going to judge from without, but we agree with each other on this topic we're talking about today about scripture. And about you ask any Orthodox priest what he thinks of Sola Scriptura, he'll tell you the same exact of thing. Of course, because him. he's a part of an infallible. Church. All of, <laughs> Mormons would agree with you. Yeah, but <laughs> so Mormons have, it doesn't yeah, say much, does it? You know, they're, they're, Mormons would 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 say that. You know, hey, yeah, you got to have an infallible. I mean, I've, I've talked to LDS down here who have who have made that claim. So I mean, to me, it doesn't really matter um, because anybody Jerry Maddox can make that claim to you as a set of Acantus. So, um, and he's, he's not in communion with you guys, I'm pretty sure. Um, yeah. But like you said, so, I, like, so, like, I, I don't disagree. Like I said, those churches that are apostolic and have valid apostolic succession, they're valid churches. The LDS yeah, I, 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 so but why, why, why are you, you're not, so the question is, why are you not Eastern Orthodox? Why are you not set of a Why did you go with the Roman Catholic position? Um, there are two reasons. Um, I, I accept, I, like I said, I accepted the churches you know, way of looking at church history. Uh, that that's a, that's a that's a theological way. But as a, a pragmatically speaking, because you know we're not just minds, we're also bodies, and we're also we have culture, and we also that. Orthodox churches tend to be very um, um, tied to certain certain nationalities, like Russian, Greek, Armenian. All these things are they're very, you know, you like when you look at my big fat Greek wedding. Like their orthodoxy is also their culture. So for me from the West, it was more of a fit, if you want to call that. I'm saying this is not a true thing. I'm saying as a, as a, as a, as a Western Christian, and like you said, the development of doctrine in the West, the intellectual tradition of like the scholastics and Aquinas and Augustine, the Latin-ness uh, of the Catholic Church was more to me, uh, uh, it had a more better, it had a greater claim than the the uh, and also too like you know the 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 orthodox's history is more regional it's more uh it, you know inside they're more insular uh and more cultural than the west that was more open and more universal so that that was why i am catholic the worries is that i have is that those reasons you just gave for uh be, being catholic those reasons, I would say, are not as good as the reasons I have and New Testament scholars have for thinking that um, the New Testament books, the ones that are in there, belong in there. Um, so, like, we have history, the early, they're the earliest documents. So, I mean, I have, I have a litany of reasons for why I believe those books belong in there. And so that's why I picked, I picked the Bible, because that case you just gave for the Roman Catholic Church over the set of Acantus, which, again, the Florence Council contradicts modern Roman Catholicism because so you can be saved outside the church and Florence is no way so I mean so and that's gives credence to Jerry Mattatick's position who would say he's Roman Catholic and says you're following you know the a, a false pope you know the seat is actually vacant so you know like like these reasons for why you're not said a why you're not Eastern Orthodox they're not going to be as strong as my reasons for affirming the books in the New Testament as, as as scripture and as part of the canon and so that's okay. kind of like that's 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 just the worry is that any argument you can mount i have a stronger one for the canon um, well, i'm saying it's saying you have a canon because we gave you the canon well that assumes the roman catholic church is back that i i think back when they taught justification by faith alone i think they teach, taught sola scriptura so i, I that just well, that, that assumes your position is correct i don't agree with that and, and one thing too like just about faith alone just real quick is that you know faith is not just about faith it's also about practice right your your faith influences how you practice your faith so how you live and how you act and how you respond to a crisis is definitely tied to how your faith is but you look at how the early church dealt with something like sin and about like sins of adultery adultery and idolatry and all those issues that came up within the persecutions and people that were not exactly cuz you know when we talk look at the bible you know paul's saying be holy you need to have a holy life there are people who are becoming Catholic and they are Christians and then they're they're committing adultery. So that was a huge controversy in the early church, the, the Christians committing adultery. And so what do you do with those Christians that do commit adultery? There that's how the that's how the penance, that's how the right of penance was developed 
and it wasn't developed out of a theology of faith alone. The fact that you so have to nothing, confess nothing, to a priest. Nothing you've said is incompatible if you understand the Protestant doctrine. I'm just nothing saying that, that, said that is incompatible the, 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 the fact faith, that you wow. would the fact that you would go to a priest, confess your sins, receive absolution, is not faith alone. Uh, so yeah, it would be. People come to me and ask me for the forgiveness of their sins. I say, on the authority of God's word, say you're no longer, because you trust in Christ, you're no longer under condemnation. You're no longer under God's wrath. Your, your sins are forgiven. Uh, so that's consistent with Protestantism. That's consistent with the Bible. You're supposed to confess your sins to one another. And it certainly helps to have a minister of the gospel to uh, let people know on the authority of God's words that your sins are absolved. I, that's not inconsistent with Protestantism. May, maybe you've heard a caricature of it, but yeah, but the the, Catholic, the understanding of Protestants is that your sins are forgiven by faith alone. Your past, past, present, and future sins are forgiven. So there's not there's no absolution of current sin. There's no you know your sins are have been absolved by Christ, past, present, and future. So I don't know what sins you're absolving as a Protestant, but oh uh, no, I'm 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 not a, I'm not making them happen. I'm I'm announcing what God has already done. No, but the, the early church believed that the sins that the priest was doing was actually absolving them. Yeah, well, give, give me give me a quote. Well, I have a whole From article the, on it. Okay. I have a whole article on it at, at the Latin Rite. I've, 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 I've read your articles and the quotes you give. I don't think substantiate those points. So, I mean, you can give me a quote from there. We could we could talk about them. Um, but I mean, yeah, I, I just don't. I, I think all the arguments from church authority, the, none of them say they're infallible. Um, and I would say can, there's not a single quote in the church fathers that says that scripture and tradition are, are equally infallible. So, I mean, I mean, I don't see those. We see things about church church having authority. Protestants grant that. To say that we don't is just, a, I would just say it's a caricature, you know, so. Yeah, but going back to the original point I made is that even a council mm -hmm. of like Nicaea or, Cal, uh, or uh, Chalcedon, if you disagree with any of that council and you think that what is taught is not in the Bible, you can reject it. You believe you have the authority to do that. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, of course, of course I do, but I mean, so do you, you can reject it too. Well, not if I want to be a part of the Catholic church, I can't. You could be oriental though and reject it, go to that church, right? Yeah, but I, like, like I said, under, underneath the Catholic church, underneath that church authority, I, I'm not over that. I'm not saying that I have the final authority over that council and what the council But you can leave and go to the oriental. No one's going to like tackle you, right? Yeah, no one's going to tackle me, but I would, I would then be, a, I would then walk away from the true church, and I would go to a different church. Right. And so if if I walked away from the Bible, I'd be, I'd be walking with the biblical truth, and 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 following something that's a lie. So I mean, it's you and I are like, I mean, you, you, the the worry is like you act like there's something different, substantially different going on here, and just in terms of knowledge and epistemology, it's the same thing going on, and you nothing can stop you from leaving to become the set of Acantus either. You don't like something that Pope says, you know, people don't like him. He's kind of spicy. He says some weird things sometimes. You're like, you know what? Forget this guy. Sherry Manatix is right. <laughs> you know, you could do that. You know, a person could do that uh, theoretically. Um, you know, I, I mean, I'm joking around with you. I'm not trying to be mean or anything. But, you know, I mean, someone could could do that. Um, you know, they, they, they could just say, look, I think Jerry's right. This new Pope, I mean, the things he is saying, so against, and I've heard Catholics say this to me so against traditional Catholicism, this new guy, I'm really struggling with being a Catholic, you know, I mean, I've heard people, you know, express those sentiments before. And so you have enough and you, and you go over to Jerry Mattatick's position now, or you're, you, maybe yeah. you're sick of it and you go Oriental Orthodox or something. Yeah, I, I could be, I could be a disobedient Catholic and disobey, true. I could be a disobedient Christian and disobey the Bible, just like anybody can. So you're ascribing the property of infallibility to the church. I'm ascribing it to the Bible. I can reject the Bible. You can reject the church. Same thing. But yeah, so like I said, you your your interpretation is not infallible. So you basically are saying, I you, generally, this? I gener I generally can can be can accept this. You're not. You're, you're basically it's very 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 general. Like what you've been saying, I heard that word very a lot. So you know you're gen you have general authority. You have general reliability. <laughs> you have gen I mean, like I said, like I keep using the word pedigree. Is that why should I buy your general interpretation of the Bible over a church that exists for two thousand years and has a, a, you can you can look in history how how it developed how 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 it happened it's you know there's writers there's like Aquinas and Anselm and 
Augustine, all the, you know, there are people you can actually see and, and they wrote volumes. Why should so, I accept wait, you is, over is, them? Is your interpretation of the Catholic Church infallible? Yeah, it's, I'm not, it's not, I'm not interpreting the Catholic Church. I'm looking at. You're, you're not, you're not, the, you're not I'm, interpreting I'm, the catechism. I'm looking at your claim, right? Yeah. And I'm looking at their claim. So, yeah, but are you, are you, do you interpret the catechism of the Catholic Church? I would say I read it and I, I try it? to understand it. But I'm saying is that it's not. An, okay, not well, a, I'll just say the same thing about the Bible. I read it and I just understand it. Yeah, but like I said, you, you, you also expect people because you're a pastor to believe what you're saying. You don't go up there on Sunday and say, actually, hey, I don't. Hey, you don't, you don't, I actually you don't, don't expect it all the time. I'm saying, you don't, you don't spend all you. this time. You don't spend all this time in <laughs> seminary and on debates and dialogues just to say, you know, I'm what, just kidding Jen, with you, by the way, I really, I mean, it does people in your pastor. I, I'm going to tell, be honest with you, man. I don't think that at all. In fact, I, I call up my staff all the time and I'm like, I don't know what to do here with this situation. Let's, let's think about this together. You know, so I need people. Um, so, yeah. So, I mean, look, you read, you read it. Are you, so you're saying, you're saying when you read uh, the Roman Catholic church statements, you're infallibly interpreting those statements. Yes or no? Well, I've, I've never, never claimed that. So you're fallibly interpreting them. Well, I mean, you you keep on using this word fallibly, and, and I'm, I'm yeah, saying, I am saying you, but you also say, hey, with right reason, blah blah blah. Well, I'm saying sure. is that with right reason, I can I can be a Catholic. I can look okay. at church history. I have reason why I became so reason why I became a Catholic is that I was no, but, but that, I, I, yeah. I'm not I'm not asking that. I'm, yeah. I'm asking you. I'm asking you a question about your you're you're going off into this thing, and I'm just asking you, yeah, with right reason. But I do the same with the Bible. I fallibly interpret that. You fallibly interpret the church, right? Yeah, but are you, I, are you infallible? Well, I say I agree with the church. You're saying, "Thus saith the Lord." You uh, are saying yeah, when you I, are when saying, I, when you I, are saying when I read, when this, I read the Bible. When, when I read the Bible, I say when you're that, teaching yeah. on the Bible, you're saying this is what the Bible says. The Bible says blah blah blah. The Bible says this and that. I'm you're reading saying this. It. Yeah, I'm reading yeah, but, it. But that's just your interpretation. I don't have to buy it. No, I'm not interpreting. I'm actually, I'm actually reading out loud the sentences, and then I provide the interpretation yeah, and application, when, which, which can be fallible. Yeah. Well, like I said, with, 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 uh, with that verse about baptism, and Peter, where the NIV says you're, it's you're, a symbol. You're, you're not, you're not answering. You're just, you're asking different questions. I'm asking well, I'm you straight up. Are you? Do you fallibly interpret the cat? Just answer the question. Do you fallibly interpret the Catechism of the Catholic Church? Do you fallibly interpret statements like papal bulls, councils? Do you fallibly interpret them? Yeah, it's not. I mean, it's you're you're trying to say that because I am a Catholic and I and I interpret. You're basically saying we're in the same boat. I'm saying. No, I'm asking. I, can you answer the question though? I do. I do fallibly understand okay. that because I'm not infallible. But I'm saying is, why should I buy your fallible interpretation? Why should I buy your fallible interpretation of the Catholic Church? I'm not telling the same you question to. back to you. Any, any question you, you ask of the Bible, I can just ask of the church. Yeah, it's but completely the, reversible. <laughs> the Bible is the church is a lot more clear in its declarations and doctrines and and councils ah, okay. than the Bible is when it dis, when it talks about things that are interpreted differently. That's why you have baptists presbyterians armenians calvinists all sorts of different christians they that's why you have that, all different types of catholics who some people say we that catholics worship the same god as the muslims some catholics say no way depending on how you interpret that part of the ccc some people would hold to the part and part in view so you have the same everything you're saying you just don't real. i don't know if you realize it or you just don't want to realize it everything you're saying i could just easily reverse to you so any question you ask about the bible i can just ask of your church it's instantly reversible. It's not instantly reversible because you're you're saying the Bible is perfectly clear. It's everybody can get the same things that everybody else can. Not there's every no, part. There, the Westminster vague. the Westminster Confession <laughs> d d denies that. Not every part. The part that's that's essential for faith and practice for basic basic principles of salvation. Uh, not every. I wouldn't say the Book of Revelation. Every part is clear. Uh, I mean, I don't know where you're getting that from, but I would say the parts pertaining to salvation, yeah, they are, they are clear. And that's why, by the way, most Protestants believe in justification by faith alone. Whereas when the Catholics make a clear pronouncement about transubstantiation, 70% of them don't even believe it. So I, I just find that just fascinating that here you have this infallible church with all this clarity, and most Catholics don't believe in the most basic central part, which is a Eucharist, which is transubstantiation. But I go to Biola, I went to Westminster, I've, I've been in Christian churches all my life. I've been in different churches, every single one. 
justification by faith alone unanimous every person i walk into evangelical christian here in utah every single one justification by faith alone it's clear all right guys and that's uh nine o'clock so that's the, the 20 minutes um i forgot nate you asked the last question right i uh, uh yeah i think so <laughs> yeah okay. i did <laughs> <laughs> i forgot to eat earlier so i was like sitting here thinking man i can either pass out or I can eat something real quick. So sorry. I'm, I'm in the same boat. I feel kind of loopy. So if I if I see weird in this conversation, <laughs> it's been yeah, a long day. Yeah. My wife yeah. went to Whataburger and it's probably cold out there waiting for me. So I'm Yeah. All right. So Dennis, I think this is your third question. Is that right? Yeah, it's my third and final question. All right. So, so uh, it's all you. Got, so how is Sola Scriptura not just the enthronement of one's own personal interpretation of the Bible? Yeah, I, I would say because uh, I do listen to church fathers, I listen to church authorities, um, and they've guided and changed my positions numerous times. So it's not just me alone doing things. It's that I have people correcting me, keeping me accountable. Um, I have I have teachers, commentaries, church fathers I read, all sorts of, of creeds I read that have constantly changed my opinion. If it weren't for the church, I wouldn't have the good doctrine that I have today if it were not for, for the universal church uh, of Christ as it's expressed in the church fathers through various councils. I wouldn't have the good theology I have today if it were not for the church um, because I'm a sinner and I need other people to help me through that. Now, I'm always fallibly interpreting everything that's going to be true, but I, I have help um, and I'm, I'm thankful for that help. I'm thankful for, uh, I try to honor and, and take into consideration my spiritual fathers uh, on, on many issues, um, especially when, when they're generally reliable. I would say, you know, like you're, you don't like generally reliable, but I would say your brain is that way, you know, always right. And I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure your spouse or anybody in your family could attest to that. So, you know, so we have general reliability and you, you're in the same position. Um, you know, I could, I guess I could reverse it back on you, you know, kind of like, why are, why do you, you know, trust yourself as the ultimate interpretive authority of the Roman Catholic Church. I mean, so it, any question you ask is just, I, I think at this point, easily reversible since we're both working with the same bits here. Yeah, I would say the difference between us is I'm in disobedience if I obey my church. No, I don't think there's any you difference. Are not, you, just, are not, just, you are not, you are not in disobedience if you think that you're, that you believe something that a church doesn't teach is biblical. You are actually acting in obedience if you believe and act in your conscience against a church, whatever it believes, against the Catholic Church. You think you're in, in obedience to not agree with the Catholic Church because you think the Catholic Church teaches extra biblical or unbiblical things. So you, you, you are that authority. You are that final authority. I will be in disobedience if I do not accept what the Catholic Church teaches. And I will be in disobedience if I don't follow what the Bible teaches. I think it's the same thing. You're, yeah, just, you're, saying, you're, you're, you're ascribing it to the church. I'm ascribing it to the Bible. So that's the difference. And, you know, uh, I, I think that uh, that that I, I have changed my position on things because people have said in the church to me, you know, Nate, look at this. Look at this commentary. Look at this. You're wrong about this. Well, look at that. I am wrong about that. Yeah, I guess I'll take back what I said there. So I would be disobedient not to listen to that person in the church, whether it be a leader or a well-known scholar or, or teacher. Um, so I've had to change my views many, many, many times as a result of that. And if I didn't listen to that person's reason and they and their position of authority, I would be in disobedience. So it's possible for a Protestant to be in disobedience, just like it's impossible. It's possible for you to be uh, in disobedience to the civil authorities, just like it's possible for you to be in disobedience, you know, uh, if you were a kid, which you're clearly not, neither am I, but, you know, to your parents. Um, so, I mean, you know, it's the same thing. It's just, it's, it's just one's fallible and one's not infallible. So, um, yeah, and I would say church, church, church leaders can, can tell me to do, you know, various things. You know, um, if I go to a presbytery and they told me to tell me to put on a mask, I'm going to listen to them out of respect, um, even though I may not want to wear a mask, uh, you know, because that's what they determined is respectful. And I don't have a clear biblical argument against it, so I trust their authority. So I, it's not the case that Protestants just, it's a free for all. Um, I, I think that that's, you know, uh, misconstrued and I mean, uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm gonna let you talk more. <laughs> Sorry. Well, yeah. So, so let's take the example of Martin Luther. He was a priest in the Catholic church under the authority of a bishop. He said in the, like I said, the council died of worms that my, my conscience held captive to the, to the word of God. I can do no other. 
was he acting in disobedience to the Catholic Church? No, because he was teaching the gospel of justification by faith alone and held to that and uh, rejected the cell of indulgences and all those sort of things. So I would say that 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 there was a corruption with uh, Yosef Pelican points out, you know, that there was there was some corruption in the church at the time, but there was still justification by faith and there was justification by works. The Roman Catholic Church chose to double down, to go with justification by 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 faith and works and. You know, uh, that's a simplification. I know it's more complicated, the Catholic view of salvation. I'm simplifying, so forgive me for that. But um, but yeah, so so there were two oh views of justification God. and Rome, Rome went with the one that, that was the tradition that was faulty. As Pelican points out, it was Eastern Orthodox. He's, you know, so he says that in the riddle of Roman Catholicism. Um, so yeah, that's, that's why is because the church codified a tradition and was doubling down on a tradition um, along justification by faith that was, that was bad. And so, yeah, he had to stand. I think he was right to do it. Um, he was not perfect. He said some really stupid things in his life, um, some really offensive things, but so much for the infallibility of Martin Luther. Um, so you're saying, so let me get this right. So he is actually under the authority of the church, like in his life, like that's his, that's his church. He belongs to it. He's yes. a priest. He's been ordained yes. like yes. you, like in your church. Right. But he, but he, and, and, and from the church's view, from the church's point of view, he is being disobedient. He is going to the church for the churches. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm sure. I'm sure when, when the high priest told told Saint Peter that you know you, you know you've got to stop preaching Jesus, he says, "No, we rather listen, obey God rather than man." And so that doesn't mean that there's no civil authorities or that their authority is bunk. That just means they're wrong. There, authorities can be wrong. So was uh, the church was it was the Catholic Church a valid authority over Luther? Yes, absolutely. At that so time. Luther, so Luther yeah. was disobeying the church. He was in disobedience. Just like St. Peter was disobeying the civil authorities, so they rather obey God rather than man. Yeah. So, so he so he was in disobedience to, to, to no, I would not not to God, but to the church at that point. Yeah. Okay, so so basically, if <laughs> that's why I'm kind of confused because general just, general reliability, like okay, it's very I'm gonna explain it to you. Parents, you're, you're a dad, right? Yeah, I have three kids. Can can you be wrong? According to my wife, often. <laughs> so, but your pay, should your kids listen to you? I would say I hope so. That doesn't mean that your authority is bunk. Your your kids can be disobedient to you when you say the wrong thing or you request the wrong thing. I, I mean, that's all I'm saying for the church. I, I'm, I'm confused why why that's uh, maybe I'm not maybe, maybe I'm not being clear, and that's my fault. So, well, I'm just just using the example we used about you and and your your interpretation of scripture, and that you're not in disobedience when you. When you interpret it differently than, a, than your, the church you belong to, and how, but you said that church was an authority over you, and so yeah. you would want that church to, you want that person to accept your authority and to, and, 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 and like saying how, how, but Luther is e even in a greater situation here, and you're saying he's, he's not in disobedience. That's my, my concern is that. Same, same uh, let me, let me just apply it, make it dumb it down to the family unit. Yeah, you're, you're an authority of your kids, you're the dad, all right, you can be wrong. You tell your kids, hey, you know what? You just burn all your Bibles up. Let's just let's just let's just go outside and have a bonfire with scripture and laugh over it, cackle over it like like we're we're possessed demons or something, you know. Well, you th know? thanks for assuming we have Bibles because some people think Catholics don't, but we do. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I I know you do. I'm sure you you read it a lot. Um, so you know. Um, you guys are, you know, burning this Bible, having a bur Bible burning festival, you know, and when your kids are like, no, I'm going to obey God. I'm not going to disrespect this holy book. I, I can't do that, dad. I'm, I'm, you know, if you're going to make me do this and you're like, you're going to, you're going to listen to me or I'm kicking you out of the house. We're burning Bibles right now. It's going on. It's going to happen. And your kid's like, you know what? I'd rather listen to God than you, dad. I'm leaving the house. I'm, I'm leaving the house. I can never burn God's word. That's what Luther did. I mean, I, that's basically the situation. Does that Yes, the church was an authority. I, I, I'm not like a LDS rest restorationist. I think the church had authority all the way through there. I, I, I generally think it was reliable, even in its difficult times. Um, I respect medieval theologians. I'm not like, you know, some person that just says, forget all church history. I'm not saying that. So just to, we're clear on that. So I'm saying that they had that authority and uh, that did, Luther did go against it. And that doesn't negate the fact that you're still authority of your kids, even though you ask them to burn Bibles and they say, no way. And they said, leave my house. And they're going to leave your house and leave the authority of your roof. And I would say a similar thing is going on there with Luther. Yeah. Well, I would say that the fact that Luther uses the word conscience 
ind indicates what he's doing there. So, so he's saying that my conscience and, and what I think the Bible says is over, it, it, it negates, I have the right as, as, as a Christian or whatever, you know, I have a right as a Christian in my, with my conscience and the Bible to basically overthrow the authority of the Catholic Church. That's what he was saying. Yeah, and I, I would say your, your, your kids have the authority to leave your house, overthrow your authority if you tell them to burn Bibles or else you're not under a roof anymore. I'd say the same thing is true of you. Yeah, I mean, and then that the civil magistrate that we live in, you know, made some crazy pronouncement that we have to deny Christ. We would all, I would, I would go to somewhere else. I'd leave the United States. I would, I would leave this authority. So, I mean, it's the same structure with the church. It's all the same. So, I mean, I, I think the church is authority. I respect the church. I struggle with some of the church stuff that they ask me to do sometimes. I do it because out of respect and obedience. I'm not perfect at it. I wish I were better, but I, I would give it the same same authority that I give my, my father, even as a as a man. So um so yeah, I I I, I trust it and I and I it, I'm thankful for it. I'm thankful for Christ Church to help me through things. Um, but I just don't describe the property of infallibility to it. I treat it like the civil government magistrates and to uh, like parents and kids kind of thing. So, but would you agree that Luther at that moment was, was adhering to his own personal interpretation of the Bible over that of the authority of the Catholic church? Uh, yeah, well, he's following that. Um, yeah, just like people interpret the Catholic church for different things today. So yeah, it's the same thing as going on. Yeah. So at that moment, he was the one that made that he was the, he, he enthroned his personal interpretation over that of the Catholic church. It's like you enthrone it every time you interpret the catechism. You, you think your interpretation's best. You hold the Latin right. You think that's that's superior. You, 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 you whether you hold the material sufficiency or the part of part of view or whatever, you know, you're going to enthrone your interpretation and how you read it. It's, there's no difference there. You both, you and I both do that. Uh, I, I think you got to be honest. Say that, that we that you know that there's not a major difference there. Like we're trying to make it sound like the only thing is you're just you're you're what you're doing. All you're adding on is act, extra revelation that you have to interpret. If you think it's revelation, if you're Peter Stravinskis, you might think it's revelation, um, but other Catholics don't think that. So there's actually dis disagreement whether tradition is, well, is, is revelation. Yeah. yeah, I would say that, like I said, the difference between both of us is I would be acting in disobedience and you would be acting in obedience. As you said, Luther was doing. Luther was acting in obedience to the word of God as his conscience was saying. And so he was disobeying the church but being obedient to his conscience. So he was making his interpretation the final authority over that of the, uh, you said is a valid authority of the church. So if I am being disobedient, I'm being like Luther. If you are being obedient, well, you are being we're, like Luther. You're, you're, you're like Luther, Luther too, because you made the choice to follow which church. You used your fallible interpretation process. You picked out a church. You didn't say it was Synod of the Cantus. You didn't say it was the Oriental Orthodox. You didn't say it was Eastern Orthodox. You made a fallible choice. You lorded it up over all those churches and you said, me, Dennis, I'm going to pick this one. So, yeah, you started off as a final authority making these epistemic decisions and saying, yeah, I think the evidence is here. I'm going to pick this church. If the evidence is no longer there, you're going to say, bye-bye, church. I'm going to go with this church. That's what you're going to do. So, I mean, you're, you're, you're the final authority here in picking out the Catholic church. If you don't like what it says or you feel like it's going against tradition or whatever gauge you use, whatever evidence you use is no longer there, it's just proven to you, you're going to go with a different church. In disobedience. You, well, that assumes you're picking the Catholic Church. That assumes you're that begging the question because you're well, assuming you're, 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 you're assuming when you say that that you picked out the right church. So you're just assuming it. Well, you're assuming you picked out the right Bible. You're, you're, absolute, you're but, absolutely you're absolutely right. See, on that on that yeah. we're um, well, that are brothers. You are. What I'm saying I, is that, I, I like you said, you, yeah. like I am acting in obedience or disobedience. If I disagree, you're acting in obedience. When I when I set out to become a Catholic, I would didn't actually didn't set out to become a Catholic. I actually was very anti-Catholic and was trying to disprove Catholicism, and I, and I started investigating the Church Fathers, and that's how I became a, a convert. You read those I started, I Fathers, I, you interpreted them, and you made the choice out of no, all of these no, churches. I did not have a preconceived understanding of the Church Fathers at all. I, I was I had nothing, and I started reading Ignatius, and all I I, I couldn't find my beliefs in the early Church. I, well, I, I know un, un, under your fallible interpretation, which you're using as an arbiter to interpret these fathers, then coming to the conclusion that, oh, I think Rome's the right one. 
It, I mean, you act like you have some sort of special ability here, like uh, power, but in reality, you're just doing the same thing we all do, you're making choices. And to deny that, I think, is not looking at what's going on here. I'm not denying you're, anything. I'm saying that you my, made a fallible choice my, to follow Rome using evidence for eating the church fathers. That's all you're saying. You're trying my, to talk more and spice it up. But at the end of the day, my, my, we're doing the my, same thing. And, and, I, and I, I would say I did the same thing, too, with the Bible. I looked at the evidence and look at all this evidence for the canon. And I'm like, OK, this looks pretty good to me. I think this is pretty obviously the case. And you did the same thing with the church fathers. So we're both doing the same things. And I'm just pointing that out. That's all. Yeah, but like I said, it's not, we're not doing the same thing because you are the final authority in, in that process. Who made the decision to follow Rome? Well, I, I'm saying I, I looked in the history of the church and I said, did, did you make fact, a decision if, to follow Rome? Everybody makes choices. It's not, that's right. Not so the you're the here. final authority. That's, so why can't I no. just say that about you? You're saying that about me. Why can't I just say that about you? I submitted to authority. I did not become an authority. You I submitted are to authority. authority of the Bible. I didn't become an authority. You, you interpret it, and then if you disagree you with someone, too. no, I, I interpret it. I, I, I submit to the church's interpretation. Uh, um, well, I submit to the Bible's interpretation. Well, that's not the Bible is not a, a person that makes judgments, and it's not the, the, it, the, the church is not a person that makes judgments. So, so listen, it, it, you, it's, it's just reverse. You can reverse it, it either way. It, it does. It does make judgments. Talk to you and have made, a valuable conversation with. The church made a judgment two weeks ago about the ordination of women priests. You interpreted it, didn't you? It said any anybody who ordains a woman or anybody involved in ordination is excommunicated. That's pretty straightforward. Well, yeah. How do you define excommunication? I, I mean, nowadays, how do you define a woman? You know, how, how do you define ordination? You have to look into all those things. You're using fallible knowledge. So yeah, you're 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 having to make in, in decisions, and you're to follow this. Um, and I would say the clear parts of Scripture: God declares righteous and godly by faith. It says that there. It is. It's really clear. I can do the same thing. So anything you say, I can just, any question you ask with the Bible, any problem you ask the Bible, I will then just reverse that and do that to the church. It's kind of what I'm doing here. I don't well, mean if, to be yeah, if, to you. If, yeah, if you say that we all read things and we all assimilate things and we all come to understanding of things. That's called interpretation, by that's, the way. That, that yeah. is, if we, you know, that we can all, every Catholics understand, Catholics can interpret the Bible. They can do these things. They can have discussions on things. I agree. But, want, but once agree. it's once it's settled, once it's declared, this is it. Once the borders but you have to interpret the declaration. But once the borders of orthodoxy are established, end of discussion. Right. For you, you have, for you, you, you it's you not. To, then, 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 why do you have people interpreting different parts of of the church's teaching? Well, I mean, I'm saying that once the authority, the church, the official authority of the church makes a decision. It's done. For me, if I want to be obedient, I have to follow it. As, but you have to Protestant, interpret it. You, you're, you you're, 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 you're just repeating yourself. You're not dealing with the issue of interpretation. You're just saying, I just see it. you know. And I could say that about anything in the Bible. And I, I can just basically do what you're saying and do it with the Bible and say, no, I see it's really clear. It's obvious once the Bible says something and I have scripture, interpret scripture. It's so clear and so obvious. And once it says it, that's it. I have to be obedient if I don't do anything. Else. And, and everything you're saying of the church, I, you're just basically... This whole thing is just an instance of special pleading. You're giving yourself special position and status, saying that oh, yeah, there's some sort of magic thing going on at the church. But that's but but like I'm doing something terrible with the Bible. When in reality, we're both doing the same thing. You're interpreting statements. I'm interpreting statements. Um, so you're, you're doing you're it with your fallible mind. I'm doing it with fallible mind. I so chose. I, I made a decision to follow the Bible. You made a decision to follow the Catholic Church. So, I mean, so, I've so not seen any you're evidence. Saying, you're saying that, we're both doing special pleading. So we're both. We're oh both no! Wrong. No no no! I I, I was I, I I I was saying that we're both doing the same thing and to say. Well, you said I'm doing special pleading, pleading, but you're not doing special pleading because of the Bible. And then I'm like, well, if we're both doing the same thing, we're both doing special. Pleading. I don't I don't think you have understood me properly. I said that we're both doing the same thing and to say otherwise is a special pleading. That's all I'm saying. What what is special pleading? Sorry, I, I just minute saying saying that like that. Well, it's it's different what I do because I'm I'm doing it and it's um doing this magical way. I'm I'm exempt from all these things and it's like well I don't think you are exempt. You're you have to do the same thing. You have to use your mind. You know that's fallible. You have to interpret things. You have to interpret statements and to say like well if I don't do that I'm being disobedient to the church. It's like well yeah well if I don't do that I'm being disobedient to the Bible. But I have to interpret the Bible. You have to interpret the church. And you don't have a living uh, person to talk to that speaks infallibly to you. Say, oh, I'm going to call up, you know, the Pope right now. He's going to tell me everything about this. You don't have that. You have to interpret papal bulls, councils. You have to interpret all those things. And those are, I'm, I mean, gosh, if I can interpret the Council of Trent, I, I mean, I would feel a lot better about myself. It's, 
tough to interpret. Even the catechism today, the catechism, people don't know whether Muslims worship the same God as Catholics because they interpret that phrase in the CC with, with, with us worship the one true God. Wait, is it saying the Trinity is No, not it's it's, say, it's saying there, there are degrees of under, like general relativity. I, I, it's a general revelation. That's what that that's what that's talking about. Well, that's is your it, interpretation, but not everybody I, well, thinks that. I'm, I'm saying is that that you know that's that's the understanding that there is a one God and that's revealed in revelation or in, in uh, nature. I mean that that you know that is what it's talking about. Like it's not I mean, there's there's disagreements. Like I said, as a Catholic, I can I can disagree, but I am in, acting in disobedience. If you disagree with anything you 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 are taught, or any book you read, or anybody you debate, as long as you can say I follow the Bible, you think you're obeying. As long as you say I'm following the church, I mean, I just say the same thing with the church. I just reverse it to you. Yeah, but thing is, my my church, like I said, it's an it's actually an authority that makes decisions on biblical and theological things well god makes decisions in the bible and i read them and the, the church makes decisions so you're saying that you're, you're ultimately gonna you're you're punning to, to god as the you know the authority that you go to in and scripture that, yeah and you're appealing that, to god that, and, cert, and that's that, that authority certifies your interpretation um well it, that 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 authority you give the church and you interpret it that gives your that gives you that you're that authority so it's everything's reversible here um all right, guys, that is the end of the 20 minutes there. Nate, it is your time for your third and final question. Uh, so, uh, 20 minutes. Yeah, so um, third one is, um, and this is interesting. So would you say that there is stronger big biblical evidence for the Roman Catholic Marian doctrines than the doctrine of Sola Scriptura? Like, and what, what I'm thinking of there in that question is particularly Mary ascending into heaven and not dying? Um, well, since I think that the soul scripture is not taught in scripture, I would have to say yes. <laughs> so, well, like so, I said, yeah. oh, so, so, so what evidence do you have that Mary ascended into heaven? Well, I would say that the Catholic would, verses, when, it, when they want to use a verse or when scripture. a passage, would you, they would use Revelation 11, 19 through, through uh, 19, uh, 11, 19 through 21, uh, 11, 19, and 20, 12, 20, do, you, 12, do you know? Do you know any church fathers? Verse two hundred years of the church. Any contemporary academic commentators who would who would take that view? Well, like I said, I mean that, that the church has de officially defined it, so I accept it. Actually, they haven't interpreted that passage. Well, I know. I'm saying I, I accept the church's authority, so I accept. Right, I know, but but I'm talking about that passage that you mentioned from Revelation. I think it's twelve. Yeah. Well, I'm saying I, I I understand that, but I, I don't like I said I don't rely solely on the uh, church fathers. So yeah, you know, I mean, so there, there's no case biblically for the ascension, in a, but there's at least a case that commentators grant, and and uh, uh, that I, I would say other other Protestant performers have said. I mean, not Calvin, but that would say that basically, yeah, scripture scripture alone is taught there. Um, it says don't go beyond scripture. It doesn't. You you have something about the twelve tribes of Israel. That's woman. There is Israel. It's there's as all commentators pretty much grant. And as the, I mean, church fathers grant that no one, no one said that was Mary ascending to heaven. You don't have anything in the first 200 years about Mary. It's the first 300 years about Mary ascending into heaven. And so this is what's bizarre is that here we are in the situation. And this is my point is that I have a verse that says, don't go beyond scripture. And you're dying in the soul scripture. You have a verse in Revelation and talking about the, the church of Israel and about a male child, you know, chasing after Satan, saying that's about Mary ascending into heaven. And I just want to observe the irony of this for, for me personally, because it does seem to me that 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 that's uh, that's not very plausible. And so, when you hold to this authority without ever checking it, without doing what 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 the Bereans did with Paul and see if they were so, is you end up saying things that sola scriptura is not biblical. It says don't go beyond scripture, and then you have to say, well, this verse of all commentators and the old church fathers pretty much said like, okay, this is not referring to Mary. Here, uh, you have to say that it's referring to Mary. I mean, there's not a shred of biblical evidence that Mary sent it in heaven. Well, I said if, if a Catholic church would use a verse, we would we would we can use that verse. I'm saying that my my acceptance or rejection of that doctrine or dogma mm -hmm. is not based on my personal interpretation of the scriptures. It is yeah, I know, and based and on the authority or, of the church, or, or really hardly anybody's for that matter. I'm saying I I, I don't. It's not it, like I said the the Catholic faith is not consensus. It's not it's not de democratic. It is mm -hmm. it is this is what the church says, and do you, do I obey or disobey? Yeah, so, I, I think I, I I think that that much is, is clear. I would say the same is true of the Bible. 
but that's because again i ascribe the property of infallibility of the bible you're 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 ascribing it to the church here um so that's going to happen so yeah i i just i mean that's that's kind of like for protestants you know we read the bible we interpret it just like you interpret the catechism and we see mary is not taught here no one thinks this here and uh, there's nowhere to top that, but yet you're being all hyper skeptical about First Corinthians four six. So at the end of the day, what really matters is look, I, none of these Bible verses matter. I'm just going with the church, and that's it. And that's what kind of what it seems like from my vantage point is it, it doesn't matter what you say, Nate. It's just a church, and I'm going with the church. And it doesn't matter what you say, it's a church. And as what the Bible says, you know. So your arguments against First Corinthians four six, I mean, you can't consistently leave them out a case for Mary sitting into heaven. So really, you're just going to go with with what the church says because it says it. And I mean, I guess I would do that with the Bible at some level. So, you know, I mean, I'm not, I'm not trying to fault you too much for that, but, <laughs> you know, um, not trying to be too brutal here. Um, but, you know, that's, that's kind of, that's kind of my worry. I don't know if you want to. Well, I understand it's your worry, but like I said, if, if you, you basically have an assumption that you have that ability, you, you have the final say what, uh, regarding Mary. And, you and have the final her, say of, of, of what church is the true church. I'm saying you have, you have, so we're talking about Mary. We're not talking about the true church right now. We're talking about your assumption, your, your understanding of the Bible in relation yeah. to Mary. You have that authority to say, these are, this, these, this doctrine is not biblical. Therefore, I don't have to buy it. You, you, I'm saying you do the same thing. I'm saying is that the church has authority and it also can interpret Bible verses like Revelation 11, 19, I, I accept the church's take on that way more than I accept you. The, the, the church does not have an infallible take on that passage. I'm just saying, if, if according to Catholic church, answers, there's only seven verses that are defined. I'm just saying, if if the church were to interpret this infallibly, I would I would accept that interpretation over yours. I I don't I am not bound to accept you your interpretation of anything. I, I, not, I, so I, so 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 likewise though i mean like again everything you say to me i could just say back and that's always what we're seeing here when this throughout this whole discussion is that like you say well that's 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 your final ultimate authority i don't have to go with that i could say that about your choice of the catholic church you choose a church you you, you and when you choose that church you actually whether you want to acknowledge that or admit it or not, I, I do believe on some level that you do interpret it um you, you interpret that that phrase some people interpret that to mean that catholics and muslims certain worship the the same true God. Some people um, interpret scripture and tradition to be part and part of or material sufficiency. So you're always going to have this going on here. I don't, I don't think you're going to be able to escape it. You could try to deny it and not face it, but I mean, we're, we're both doing the same thing. I'm picking the books of the canon. You're picking what church. And when we, when we pick these things out, we're now going through the process of interpretation. You're just having additional revelation going on and on and on, whereas I'm I'm closed and fixed on this on this canon. Yeah, um, I, I yeah I don't think you basically are saying that like, you know you 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 are you are in a special in a in a special place, right? That you you have this that you basically say these are these are the books I was given. This is what I believe. This is what the Bible says. And and then you you say well you know the church the Catholic Church says X. And that X is not in the Bible. Therefore, the Catholic Church teaches extra biblical things, right? That's what you're saying? Um, no, I wouldn't just say that. That's not all I'm saying. I'm saying you, you believe you have that authority to pass judgment upon the Catholic Church's views on Mary. I mean, so do you. No, I, I, I as a Catholic, have to accept them. Or, or if you don't, if you, if you don't like them, you can, go to the, you can go to the Orthodox Church. Yeah. It, it, be disobedient like if i if the, if the catholic church is the then, I, then, I, then, I, then, I, then i can be disobedient to the bible well yeah but you 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 have that like i said my ability to interpret the bible is that i accept what the catholic church teaches yeah, i'm because not, you, I'm you, not you, relying you, on me you, you give you know because you give that church greater authority than the bible i would say in how you're functioning um no, so yeah I, of, of course those, those 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 the Bible is the church's book, and so the, the church has the authority to interpret its own book. You don't yeah, you don't I, have the authority to, ter, to ter, interpret our book. Yeah, I'm, that's assuming your position is correct, and that's assuming you're right about this interpretation, which I'm disputing with you. So you're just you're merely you're merely you're all you're doing is merely making statements that oh I'm you know I'm not interpreting anything. This is a true church. It's not my personal opinion. You're merely making a statement when I'm saying no, you did choose, you made a choice, you are infallibly interpreting, and then you're repeating back to me the opposite. When you're not really dealing with the arguments, you're just merely like making kind of statements, I guess, authoritative statements. I, I guess similar to like Romics without even addressing 
the substance of what I'm really saying, which is, you know, you're using your fallible, finite, fallen human opinion to select this church. You could select a different church. I'm using my file, fallible, finite human opinion to select these books. I could pick different books. Um, now, I happen to find these reasonable. You happen to find the Roman Catholic Church reasonable. We're using our fallible reasoning. We're using the selection process. And so uh, none of us is doing anything different, um, except I'm just not ascribing infallibility to the church. So yeah, of course, I'm not going to listen to the church is infallible uh, because I don't think it is. I think it's fallible. I think it's helpful. I think it's good. But I think the Bible's infallible. So yeah, yeah. we're going to have different ways of going about this because we're, we, we, we're putting more authority behind something than the other person is. And so that's going to happen. But we're both ultimately doing the same thing. No, you judge. I submit. Uh, you, did, did, you, did you judge to the Roman Catholic Church to be true? Well, I, I I became a member of the Catholic Church, so basically, did you judge it to be true? You're, That's you're, you're saying you're saying you're did saying did you that, judge it to be true? Hold, hold, it's the, hold on, hold answer on, the question. Let, hold on, let me back up here. So okay. back in the time of the apostles, where someone came to someone and says, "Hey, this is the gospel. Come be baptized, join our church." You're saying that they judged and they said that's the that's the that's you know they're they're. No, I'm, I'm, I'm asking you a question. Did you judge the Roman Catholic Church to be true? It's like I said, you're, you're basically. Did making, you judge it? Yes or no? It's yes, a simple question. I don't know why you're not yeah, being able to. I mean, well, I, I'm, say, I'm saying is that you, you are placing authority in my, like you're saying my authority is, is equal to that of the Catholic Church because I interpret it. And I no, 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 no. I'm asking you, did you judge it to be true over the Eastern Orthodox Church? I came to the conclusion that the Catholic Church's claims that it is the church Christ established were true. So you judged it to be true? I believe it's true. Yes. Did you judge it to be true? So wh why are you saying do you judge it to be true? Because you're you said that you're, 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 you're said basically you're, trying to get me in this circular thing, like no, 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 because, because, the same because, thing. because but like I said, you, you, you have no yeah. authority apostolically. You're, you, you, you don't, you have no claim to the historical church at all. Well, so I, I, I don't, I, I, I don't, I don't claim to be an apostle. So that's, I don't think the Bible teaches that. So that's, you're, you're, you're assuming your framework of the church and imposing it on me, but I, but, the, but, but, the but, you, but, you, but, 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 but you're, you're talking a lot, but you're not really interacting here. And I want you to interact with what I'm saying, because that, that's what we're here to do. So I'm, I'm saying I, so, that, so, so I'm you, saying you, that you, the early you, the churches that are claim in, in apostolic succession, like you say, also claim to be infallible. They, there's a reason why because okay. they accept apostolic succession. You don't have apostolic succession, so all You're you have is your own personal interpretation. You don't submit to an over-authority of, of a church as that authority that when it defines a dogma or a doctrine, you have to accept or be in disobedience. You can reject it and still be in obedience. It's different. We're categorically different. Dennis, you're just talking, but you're not. So you said, you, you said I, I judge things. I judge what's true and so on and you don't judge things and i asked you did you judge the roman catholic church to be true and you've gone on this long side trail not really answered or interacted with me on that and that's unfortunate you don't want to admit that you've judged the roman catholic church to be true over the eastern orthodox church you are an arbiter of truth you are judging things whether you want to acknowledge you can talk about other things but at the end of the day you're just you, i'm just asking these straightforward questions and you're going on these monologues and i i want this to be a conversation here i'm subordinate i'm not i'm not I'm not an authority. It's like, did you we, choose we, to be subordinate? If we go before the Supreme Court and we have a case, right? And the court rules in one of our favors or another. And it says, this is the law. It's the law of the land, the civil hmm. authority. It, the buck stops with the Supreme Court, regardless of whether or not we interpret it, whether or not we agree with it or disagree with it. That's now the law. That's what I'm saying. The church is the church is the fi it's the final say. Is the Supreme not Court always right? I'm not saying it's always right. I'm saying that. At it, but is it a valid authority? Does it make authoritative decisions? And are people obliged to to accept it, whether or not they like it or not? If yeah, I don't, you could, if you, I break you, the you law, could, you could you could choose to leave the country after all, though, and and you could say this is wrong what they're doing here, and so you choose to leave the country, and so you. You've chosen to follow the Roman Catholic Church over the Eastern Orthodox. I've chosen the canons. You just want to say that you didn't choose or you don't want to judge it or something. And you start talking about other things and not acknowledging, I think, that very clear and simple truth that I chose to follow the, the books of the New Testament and the Old Testament. You've chosen to follow here the church. You've made that determination, reasoning, judging. 
and coming to that conclusion. You, you, you subordinate, you chose to subordinate yourself to that, just as I chose to subordinate myself to those books. I don't think there's really any difference here, but you can, you, you can, I know, I know you want to talk about other things. So I understand that. What I'm saying is that you, you, you subordinate yourself to a book. A book, What's that? You, you subordinate yourself to a book, right? You said so. So, so, but you, yeah, so if, you, you so if, we, writing, if we got so. together in physical, in, if we're in physical space together, right? We had the Bible there. We said, okay, Bible judge between us, like that. We have to open it, read it, and all that. I mean, you have to, there's there, there's processes that happen within the Bible to interpret it and all that stuff. I'm saying is that as the church declares that 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 is where I that's where I stand. I don't, I don't, I'm not the final judge of the church. Like I, if I make a judgment on the church and say, well, I disagree with you, the church doesn't have to go, okay, I accept you, you're, you're right. Uh, well, you know, that's not how it works. You have the final authority in everything you, you believe and how you practice and all that. You're, you interpret a book and that's how you believe and practice your faith. I don't do that. I adhere to a church that is an authority, a living authority with the living, the living uh, successor to the apostles and that does, they do councils, they do, you know, papal statements, they do all these things because it's a living authority. That, yeah, well, I, I think I think you're just repeating yourself after the comments I've made. You're not responding to the reasons I'm giving. I've mentioned that you that you don't have conversation with any any uh, infallible person. You have to read documents uh, just as I do. You just have more of them. Um, and I don't think you've really interacted with that. You've talked about, you know, how it's, you assume to the Catholic authority. And you've repeated that, but I don't think you've shown any meaningful difference other than just saying there's a difference. Um, and so that's that's my my worry with your position is that the only thing only recourse you have is to talk about other things rather than than face this fact that you do have to interpret things. And that's of course why you have different different interpretations of Catholic documents, uh, different people in the Catholic Church having different views. Um, there's more difference in the Roman Catholic Church than there is in the Evangelical Church, in my in my humble opinion. But I and, could be and they're that, they're, but. In, they're in disobedience. Yeah, well, I mean, that's that that's fine. I would say that people who disagree are in disobedience also. So I mean, everything you've said is just I could say, yeah, well, you too. Well, yeah, you too. It's it's very reversible. And um I, I thought my, my parent analogy would work, but apparently it has no, it's, it's, I think it's it's categorical because it's not it's not just buying someone's interpretation of a book because they think it says something. It is it is does the Catholic Church have authority? based in apostolic succession from the beginning. And I think the Catholic Church can make that claim because the other East, the other churches that claim infallibility also have that. And it's it's shown in history. You so know, they, history. They, both, they both equally have it, then how are you going to pick which one there is? It kind of kind of becomes tough at that point. You have to use a lot of fallible weird reasons if you think that's true. Yeah, and, and that, at that point, you, it's re, you, you have to have reason. There's reasonable you know arguments you right. can accept. Just like I do with the canon. But what I'm saying is you're, you're picking between valid churches you're not judging those churches and making yourself the final authority in whether those churches are. So there are, are, are they, is it Eastern Orthodox a true church in your opinion? Yes. Um, so, but you can't take communion there. Yeah. Cause they're not in full communion, but that doesn't mean they're not a true church. And they have a different, they have a different view of God than you do. They deny simplicity. They hold to a different God. Um, I don't, I don't yeah, think, they have, that, I, I, I think I they, have a, they, they have a different understanding of how, how that is. Cause their, their theologies maybe have developed differently, but we still hold the same, like you said, those those well, we, we hold the the Ecumenical councils that are seven, but like I said, they no, not, they, not, not the not, not the Oriental. Um, what I'm saying is that those churches, like I said, they have they have apostolic succession, therefore they have valid they're valid churches. Uh, are they, they're not successors of Peter, are they? I mean, how many successors do you have to have there? Well, the apostolic succession means not just Peter, but the apostles themselves. Okay, so so they're they're not they're not successors of Peter. I no. thought I thought the 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 Roman Pontiff is. Uh, a little bit higher there on the Roman view. Yeah, he's pr he's he has primacy, which they all agree on. But not but not but not the same. You 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 hold it differently than they do, don't you? Yeah, there's disagreements, and like I said, we're working. Right. I, I quoted yeah. you from the 2007 conference where we had joint we came together and had a joint statement. So there is there's dialogue between our churches. The, the we, Council of Florence says that there's no salvation outside of the Roman Catholic Church, the Eastern Orthodox Church, and not the Roman Catholic Church. Yeah, I would, I would, I would have to look at that, but I would say that's more geared towards the, the specific Roman Catholics rather than the Orthodox. But like I said, that, that the, that's a, the that's a really, church, that's a Catholic really, church, the Catholic that's, church a, that's does, a really novel interpretation of that text. That is not the clear reading of that text at all. What I'm saying is that so I guess we're having to do some interpretation here. I'm saying, of, I'm of saying Rome. the Catholic church, let me ask you do, you, do you have any idea, does the Catholic church recognize the Eastern Orthodox as a valid church? 
uh, well, not according to the Council of Florence, they would. No, I'm saying that the Catholic Church, does it, that you, when, you, when you look at the Catholic Church, you like said this document here that I have in front of me, yeah. it says that we accept that, that each other has a valid church. So it's from them. They, 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 they I, I would, I, I, I've, I, I've, I've heard disagreements about that one. So uh, um, you could, I'm sure you could argue either way. Well, I'm saying it's, the official, it's, not, it's not clear, I would say. No, I'm saying it's perfectly clear because the church has said it constantly. According to you, actually, I, I, not every Catholic I've talked to has said that. But well, I'm, I'm referring to actually the, the official church teaching about the Eastern Orthodox well, Church. Well, what, 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 what an infallible statement was made that said that they're that they're part of the Catholic Church now. There's no fallible statement need to be made. There, there have apostolic success. Oh, oh, okay. So, so they have. So that's just your fallible opinion of it then. <laughs> that they have apostolic succession. Yeah. No, that's a historical fact. Okay, well, it's a historical fact that the can books of the canon are the right ones. Because the church picked them. Well, that's not what I believe. I, I use my reason just like you use your reason. Well, you're you're, 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 you're just calling certain things. So there's no infallible statement that says the East is just with the Catholics. Um, that doesn't, there aware. doesn't need to be one. They have an apostolic succession. Doesn't need so to you don't, so you don't, you don't, you don't need the church to tell you that, that you just come to it on your own, you, that you're the final arbiter of that. No, I'm saying that that's that's a historical fact that you can actually look at history and see that these churches were established by apostles and those apostles have successors and those successors. But but so yeah, and, and I, I guess Jerry Maddox would say it's an historical fact that Florence contradicts the, the current catechism and that's just a fact. And so you, the seat is vacant. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 anybody can make these claims, you know. So it just seems like I mean you're 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 just calling things fact and you're kind of. You're using strong language, uh, kind of uh, using strong claims to cover up the fact that you and I are both in the same position. You're just kind of you're kind of upping your language, but without any any evidence, and not willing to admit that you make decisions. This is that no one said that the Eastern Orthodox Church is a true church, in, and there's no infallible statement like that in Rome. Um, just just like the statement evangelicals and Protestant uh, evangelicals and Catholics together or Lutherans and Catholics together, that had no that had no infallible weight behind it. So it's just one person's opinion. These are these are not dogmatic sort of things. So you can call them facts, but the church doesn't recognize them as fact. And so that kind of undermines your whole kind of game here. And that's that's my worry here with this whole process. No, because I, I like I said I don't I don't have to I don't have to buy yours or their 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 interpretation of anything. You have you have no authority over binding my conscience to anything. You, you, you don't, you're, you're just basically in an opinion. Well, that's, I could say the same thing about you. You just have an opinion of, uh, of these churches being valid and you have no authority for that. Except the historical proof that they are established. Uh, except the historical and... proof that I have of the Bible. I, so you could just reverse it. This, all of this is reversible. I, I mean, I, mean I, I guess maybe I'm not communicating clear. Maybe it's a defect in how I'm talking, but uh, I mean, I don't know how you don't see this, that this is very reversible here. Tell you what, gentlemen, we are at the end of the of the twenty minutes. I believe that is all the questions. You guys uh, really appreciate the time you guys took. It was a that was a fascinating discussion. Uh, did you guys want to have some a few minutes? Are you guys open to taking some questions? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I've, I've, I've got. Can we like do 15, 20 minutes? I got. I got other things to, okay. get, to get to. So okay, let's let's do this, and we'll just. Um, it's 9.45 my time. Do you guys want to still do your closing statements or you just want to go to questions for 15 minutes? I can just go to questions. Okay. All right. So if anyone has a question, uh, just feel free to uh, unmute your mic and uh, ask the question. I see Glenn's hand up. So I'm on a phone here. So I'm at a disadvantage. So Glenn, go ahead and uh, ask your question. I think you are muted, Glenn, but feel free to unmute yourself and ask your question. Yeah, sorry, sorry about that. My uh, computer is a little slow today, so. Okay. Yeah. Um. Can everyone hear me and see see me? Because sometimes my internet connection is bad. Okay. Perfect. 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 Um. Okay. So Nate, you said that gig the word gig graphitai helps prove sola scriptura because it is used over 30 times and such. However, um, there is one uh, passage where gay gravity is used and that is uh, 1 Corinthians, verse, uh, chapter, 1 Corinthians 1, 
verse uh, verse 19, and it says, For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discernment and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. So um, my question to you is that how does, uh, and this is from the ESV, by the way, which is the version that you and evangelicals tend to use. Um, I, I, I read the Greek, I don't have any issue. Yeah, okay, that's fine. Um, but can you explain to me how a verse like that would prove sola scriptura? Like where in 1 Corinthians uh, 1 verses 19 does it say Bible alone? So yeah, it seems like you're are you asking me, um, so first, first Corinthians one nineteen is citing the Old Testament, right? But the question is, where is where is um, uh, any claim to sola scriptura in that? I, I other well, than I, I guess you just have to refer to my opening statement. I said that the formula used in, used here is a definite article in First Corinthians four six, saying that you may learn the phrase. So it's not quoting just like the scripture as it does here but this is saying it is it is in scripture this is from 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 the from the the, the page of the scripture such and such but the structure is different right, I, the, the linguistic structure is different so uh right it's just my, my question is is that you're are you saying are you saying this is a follow-up so are you saying that the verse that i gave that i cited in first corinthians are you saying that it is um Suggesting that the Old Test, the reliability of the Old Testament and the Scriptures. No, I think it's. I think it's just saying it's quoting Scripture. As I said, yeah. Okay, it is Scripture, but where does that where does that say that Scripture itself should only be used? Oh well, I, that that would be First Corinthians, four six. Right. right. So but, so you're, yeah, you're citing but, the, the use of graphiti. But you see the problem here is that um, is that. You're saying that First Corinthians four six says do not go beyond what is written, and the Greek word "graphitize" used. However, what I'm trying to say here is that it is that these thirty plus um, these thirty plus uh, times where the word "graphitize" used, it is referring to uh, uh, specific areas such as what a Christian should believe, what not be should not believe, how they should act, not to fall away from from the true church, so to speak. So, how does that reinforce sola scriptura? scriptura well i would just go back to what i originally said which is in first corinthians 4 6 is saying don't go beyond scripture graphitize used even the verse you cited as a, as a citation from scripture it's clearly referring to scripture there so i, I mean that's why it's saying don't go so beyond it's scripture. referring to the reliable so it's referring to scripture as a, as a reliable source correct uh i don't i don't think that's the point i think it's just talking about don't go beyond scripture and you go to other passages about scripture being infallible and obviously it's you, you, would, you would get that information from 2 Timothy 3.16 through 17. So that would be a different conversation. Okay, we, we want to give some other people opportunity to ask questions. I know there's only like 10 minutes or so left. Glenn, thank you for joining us, buddy. Uh, does anybody else have a question for Dennis? We went to Nate. We can go to Dennis, or if nobody has one for Dennis, we can go back to Nate. Um, just got a few minutes here. Uh, so if someone has a question, feel free. And... Uh, you can unmute yourself and ask your question. All right. <laughs> Glenn, did you have another question? Am I allowed to ask another question? It doesn't look like anybody else is, so... <laughs> Okay. We'll, give you, we'll give you the last one. Okay. Okay, cool. Um, thank you, Nate. This one is for Dennis. Okay, so um, Dennis, um, I'm a Catholic. I came into the church Pentecost 2020. Um, I couldn't come in at the Easter vigil because you know what was just starting and the bishop called everything, called um, called the whole thing off. Um, my, my question is this. So the catechism clearly states, it's a, canon law actually clearly states that if someone has an abortion within the Catholic Church and if they are Catholic, the moment you have an abortion and such, you are excommunicated from the church. So my question to you is that, you know, I, I agree with you on Joe Biden. I don't think he represents the Catholic Church at all. He doesn't represent the Catholic faith and its integrity and so forth. Um, in fact, I think within my diocese, there are some forces that don't even represent Orthodox Catholicism at all. 
Um, I also have strong opinions on the Jesuits. Anyway, my question is, um, if the canon law states that someone who has an abortion is automatically excommunicated from the church, why is it that Joe Biden, who changed his stance on abortion uh, two years ago, why, why isn't he excommunicated from the church? And why aren't, um, there's even one cardinal who said who's willing to let him receive the Eucharist at his church. So why, explain to me why any form of excommunication is not happening. Uh, I would say that uh, that question is like said, that's currently going on right now. Like they're currently mm -hmm. debating that. Um, and so I would leave it up to the church to make that decision. Um, like I said, I'm not, I'm not the final authority on it. So I, I, I basically submit to the church's authority on that, on that determination. I see. Um, if I, Devin, can I have a follow-up question, please? Yeah, go, ahead, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Uh-huh, thank you. Um, so would you, um, and I'm asking your opinion on this, do you agree, um, do you think the, the conference that the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops had last month on, this, on discussing this particular issue, do you think this was uh, necessary or do you think it was kind of uh, a rebuke to His Holiness Pope Francis, who I know is not very liked with, within the more uh, traditionalist sect of the church? Um, I think, yeah, see, I like that, that sort of thing. I honestly, I feel because Joe Biden became president and because he is a Catholic, that's what made it an issue. It's his prominence in our country and his influence. So because that happened, that made the bishops have to act. I don't know if it was, I don't, I don't necessarily think it was an act of a rebuke against uh, Pope Francis. Um, I think that he, that the, that the bishops, especially the Bishop of San Francisco uh, led the charge. And actually the Bishop, it's really interesting that the bishops of San Francisco and LA are the ones that are kind of leading the charge. Uh, and they have the most, uh, like I said, the most uh, conflict in that, that regard in their diocese. So I think they want to make sure there's no confusion with the faithful and that's why they're doing it. Oh, okay. All right. Thank you, Glenn. Uh, do you mind if I ask you a question, Dennis? I do. I do want to take any questions from you because you have a, a mohawk. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Discriminating against the mohawk here. No, you have the same color goatee, so I guess I will. Yeah, well, that's the wisdom right there. <laughs> so, quick question for you. So, you know, um, I hear this, you know, and I understand kind of the what you're saying about as far as the Catholic Church being the true church. One of the questions I have is. For example, I guess you can look at the last two popes, right? Um, Ratzinger and then uh, Pope Francis. So you have a lot of the more liberal uh, Catholics um, weren't big fans of Ratzinger and maybe different doctrines or whatever that was put forth. Um, they would interpret differently than the conservative sect, right? Same thing, it seems like almost every time Pope Francis says something, it, whether it's fairly or, it, it pro, you know, a lot of it's probably unfairly as well with the media. But I've even heard, um, I think Patrick Coffin did a show on his uh, on his um, podcast uh, where he was just saying, like, enough. You know, I've, I've had enough with Pope Francis. And I, I am friends with other uh, Catholics who are in the Latin right as well. And so I guess the question is, I guess kind of following along with Nate's thinking as far as this, who interprets, because there are some Catholics that really like the more progressive, liberal um, teachings of the Pope. And then there are very conservative Catholics like yourself, and which I'm actually very thankful for, because, you know, do a lot of pro-life work and stuff like that. But it seems like when you're, you know, you're saying the true church, it just seems that assumes the conservative uh, theological views of that church and those who are more liberal and progressive in the Catholic Church you would you would view as as false converts or or not representative of the true teaching of the Catholic Church so it seems you know you have this split so just I guess my question is how do you when you're saying that, that the church says this well some Catholics interpret, them to say one thing, more conservative Catholics interpret it to say others. You know, the Latin Rite uh, Catholics look at Vatican II, if I, correct me if I'm wrong, 
and they're not big fans of Vatican II. So how is that adjudicated? How, do, how, does, some, how does someone adjudicate that? Seems like you have to assume your position is the right one. Well, I would say too, like someone who is a, a someone who is has has beliefs, not certainly is liberal or Protestant. So um, I'm sure there are there are Catholics who are liberal, so, like like politically, but they're that they're they're pro life socially. Um, and you know that we have the the seamless garment argument that we talked about when we were on our on our podcast about you know what it, what are life issues? Are they just abortion or are they like poverty and social justice and that sort of thing? So there's that internal debate going on within the Catholic Church about kind of that identity of, 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 of what it means to be a, a political person in, in, the, in the public sphere. Um, my blog is called The Latin Right, and I call it the Latin R-H-G-H-T instead of R-I-T-E because it's a, I, I, I out myself as a conservative, basically, oh, God, a, God. a Catholic. So, but that doesn't, like I said, the example I gave is that that person on Catholic Answers that I called in and said, listen, I was baptized as an infant. I don't want to be Catholic. It's causing conflict within a person I want to marry and their family. How can I become un-Catholic? Mm -hmm. And the answer was, once you're Catholic, you're always Catholic, whether you want to or not. Yeah. It's just, it's just are, you, are you in obedience or are you in disobedience? And so, you know. But you the liberal to, Catholics would say they're in obedience. That it's you, you guys, you, you know, the the, the pro-life nuts are the ones that are in disobedience to the church, if they're the ones that are in obedience. Yeah, I would say that, well, if someone is a pro-choice or a pro-abortion Catholic, that, that is, like he's, like he, like, a, like Glenn quoted from canon law, that is objectively against Catholic church teaching. Like canon law says, abortion is wrong. And so um, they're, 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 they can say that, but um, they're in disobedience to the, to the, to the teaching of the church. Who is the, the uh, I forget the guy's name, Father James Martin, is that right? Yeah. Okay. So someone like, he, he would probably claim to be a representative of the of the church, right? He is a priest. So yeah, mm -hmm. he is he is an ordained minister. Here's the thing. My view on this whole thing goes back uh, to the early church. Back when uh, there was, a, there was a, a controversy over priests and bishops who had um, sacrificed idols, and then there was a there was a there was a discussion that said, okay, are these priests and bishops still valid bishops and priests when they come back and they're welcomed into the church? And Augustine wrote about it, and he said, listen, the sacrament does not require holiness on the part of the priest; mm -hmm. it is holiness from God. Right. The priest is just the channel. Yeah, and as Catholics, we we accept, like I said earlier, there are Catholics who are, who are not bright, who are not, who are not, you know, they're, they're not, they're not obedient. So there's going to be wheat, and there's going to be chaff, and there, and that's just I, reality. Yeah, I, I agree with all that. It just seems like they would say that that's the same thing about you, the Father James Martin and the liberal Catholics are the ones that are are saying we're the we're the true church. And uh, the other, the Latin ride and these other people, uh, the real strong conservatives, they're, they're not representative of the true church. So I guess that's what I'm saying. Well, I, well, I, think, I, think we, I think we both say, regardless of our positions, that we're both part of the church. Okay, Nate, Nate's got to get going. Nate, uh, appreciate you, buddy. Always. You guys can continue. I, I, I apologize. I just have an appointment at 830. Oh, I know, man. Um, hey, you've only given us four hours of your time. <laughs> So Dennis, hey Dennis um, uh, thanks for dialogue, dialoguing with me and being gracious with me. I appreciate it. Yeah, and I, I appreciate right, the dialogue too. So, like I said, I I, I love this sort of thing, and it's it's kind yeah. of like a cool. It's kind of like a like thing I, I always wanted to do as well. So it's good. To, yeah. It's kind of a bucket list thing. So. Well, we'll get this up on YouTube. Guys. God bless you guys. Next week, and uh, we'll have Doctor Huffling on to talk about uh, Saint Thomas Aquinas of all things. So, all right, all right. guys. God bless. Right. God bless. Bye.